Note and Dedication of Montezuma's Daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. Note. The more unpronounceable of the Aztec names are shortened in many instances out of consideration for the patience of the reader. Thus Popocatapetl becomes Popo, Huitzilcote becomes Huitzel, and so on. The prayer in chapter 26 is freely rendered from Jordanet's French translation of Fray Bernardino de Sahagun's History of New Spain, written shortly after the conquest of Mexico. Book 6 Chapter 5. To which the monumental work, and to Prescott's admirable history, the author of this romance is much indebted. The portents described as heralding the fall of the Aztec Empire, and many of the incidents and events written of in this story, such as the annual personation of the god Tezcatlipoca, by a captive, distinguished for his personal beauty and destined to sacrifice, are in the main historical. The noble speech of the Emperor Guatemoc to the Prince of Tacuba, uttered while they were both suffering beneath the hands of the Spaniards, is also authentic. Dedication My dear Jeb, strange as were the adventures and escapes of Thomas Wingfield, once of this parish, whereof these pages tell, your own can almost equal them in these latter days and since a fellow feeling makes us kind you at least they may move to a sigh of sympathy among many a distant land you know that in which he loved and fought following vengeance and his fate and by your side i saw its relics and its peoples its vulcans and its valleys you know even where lies the treasure which three centuries and more ago he helped to bury the countless treasure that an evil fortune held us back from seeking. Now the Indians have taken back their secret, and though many may search, none will lift the graven stone that seals it. Nor shall the light of day shine again upon the golden head of Montezuma. So be it. The wealth which Cortes wept over, and his Spaniards sinned and died for, is for ever hidden yonder by the shores of the bitter lake whose water gave up to you that ancient horror, the veritable and sleepless god of sacrifice, of whom I would not rob you, and for my part I do not regret the loss. What cannot be lost? What to me seem of more worth than the dead hero Guatemoc's gems and jars of gold are the memories of true friendship shown to us far away beneath the shadow of the slumbering woman, and it is in gratitude for these that I ask your permission to set your name within a book which, were it not for you, would never have been written. I am, my dear Jeb, always sincerely yours. H. Ryder Haggard The slumbering woman is the volcano Istikawakal in Mexico. Ditchingham, Norfolk, October the 5th, 1892 To J. Gladwin Jeb, Esquire Note. Worn out prematurely by life of hardship and extraordinary adventure, Mr. Jebb passed away on March the 18th, 1893, taking with him the respect and affection of all who had the honour of his friendship. The author has learned with pleasure that the reading of his tale in proof and the fact of his dedication to himself afforded in some amusement and satisfaction in the intervals of his suffering. H. R. H. March the 22nd, 1893 End of Note and Dedication Read by Patrick, 79。Chapter 1 of Montezuma's Daughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Why Thomas Wingfield Tells His Tale 
now glory be to god who has given us this victory it is true the strength of spain is shattered her ships are sunk or fled the sea has swallowed her soldiers and sailors by hundreds and by thousands and england breathes again oh they came to conquer to bring the torture and the stake to do us free englishmen as Cortes did by the indians of anahuac our manner to the slave bench our daughters to dishonour our souls to the loving kindness of the priest our wealth to the emperor and the pope god has answered them with his wings drake has answered them with his guns they are gone and with them the glory of spain oh i thomas wingfield heard the news to-day on this very thursday in the bungay market-place whither i went to gossip and to sell the apples which these dreadful gales have left me as they hung upon my trees for there had been rumours of this and that but here in bungay was a man named young of the youngs of yarmouth who had served in one of the yarmouth ships in the fight of the gravelinas ay and sailed north after the spaniards till they were lost in the scottish seas little things lead to great men say but here great things lead to little for because of these tidings it comes about that i thomas wingfield off the lodge of the parish of ditchingham in the county of norfolk being now of a great age and having only a short time to live turned to pen and ink ten years ago namely in the year fifteen hundred and seventy eight it pleased her majesty our gracious queen elizabeth who at that date visited this county that i should be brought before her at norwich there and then saying that the fortune of it had been reached her she commanded me to give her some particulars of the story of my life or rather of those twenty years more or less which i spent among the indians at the time when Cortes conquered their country of anahuac which is now known as mexico but almost before i could begin my tale it was time for her to start for cossi to hunt deer and she said it was her wish that i should write the story down that she might read it and moreover that if it were but half as wonderful as it promised to be i should end up my days as sir thomas wingfield to this i answered her majesty that pen and ink were tools i did had no skill in yet i would bear her command in mind then i made bold to give her a great emerald that once hung upon the breast of montezuma's daughter and of many a princess before her and at the sight of it her eyes glistened brightly as the gem for this queen of ours loves such costly playthings indeed had i so desired i think that i might then and there have struck a bargain and set the stone against a title but i who for many years had been the prince of a great tribe had no wish to be a knight so i kissed the royal hand and so tightly did it grip the gem within that the knuckle joint shone white and i went my ways coming back home to this my house by waveney on that same day now the queen's wish that i should set down the story of my life remained in my mind and for a long time i have desired to do it before life and story end together the labour indeed is great to one and used to such tasks but why should i fear labour who am so near to the holiday of death i have seen things that no other englishman has seen which are worthy to be recorded my life has been a most strange many a time it has pleased god to preserve it when all seem lost and this perchance he has done that the lesson of it might become known to others for there is a lesson in it and in the things that i have seen and it is that no wrong can ever bring about a right that wrong will breed wrong at last 
and be it in man or people, will fall upon the brain that thought it and the hand that wrought it. Look now at the fate of Cortes, that great man whom I have, have known clothed with power like a god. Nearly forty years ago, so I have heard, he died poor and disgraced in Spain. He, the conqueror! Yes, and I have learned also that his son, Don Martin, has been put to torture in that city, which the father won, with so great cruelties for Spain. Malinche, she whom the Spaniards named Marina, the chief and best loved of all the women of this same Cortes, foretold it to him in her anguish, when after all that had been after she had so many times preserved him and his soldiers to look upon the sun. At the last he deserted her, giving her in marriage to Don Juan Zaramillo. Look again at the fate of Marina herself, because she loved this man Cortes, or Malinche, as the, as the Indians named him after her. She brought evil on her native land. For without her aid, Tenochtitlan, or Mexico, as they call it now, had never bowed beneath the yoke of Spain. Yes, she forgot her honour in her passion. And what was her reward? What right came to her of her wrongdoing? This was her reward at last, to be given away in marriage to another and a lesser man when her beauty waned as a worn-out beast is sold to a poorer master. Consider also the fate of those great peoples of the land of Anahuac. They did evil that good might come. They sacrificed the lives of thousands of their false gods, that their wealth might increase, and peace and prosperity be theirs throughout the generations. And now the true God has answered them. For wealth he has given them desolation, for peace the sword of the Spaniard, for prosperity the rack and the torment of the day of slavery. For this is what they did sacrifice, offering their own children on the altars of Huitzel and Tezcat. And the Spaniards themselves, who in the name of mercy have wrought cruelties greater any that were done by the benighted Aztecs, who, in the name of Christ, daily violate his law to the uttermost extreme. Say, shall they prosper? Shall their evil doing bring them welfare? <laughs> I am old, and cannot live to see the question answered, though even now it is in the way of answering. Yet I know that their wickedness shall fall upon their own heads, and I seem to see them, the proudest of the peoples of the earth, bereft of fame and wealth and honour, a starveling remnant happy in nothing save their past. What Drake began at Gravelines, God will finish in many another place and time till at last Spain is of no more account and lies as low as the empire of Montezuma lies today. Thus it is in these great instances, of which all the world may know, and thus it is even in the life of so humble a man as I, Thomas Wingfield. Heaven indeed has been merciful to me, giving me time to repent my sins. Yet my sins have been visited on my head, on me, who took his prerogative of vengeance from the hand of the Most High. It is just, and because it is so, I wish to set out the matters of my life's history that others may learn from it. For many years this has been in my mind, as I have said, though to speak truth it was her majesty the queen who first set the scene but only on this day when i have heard for certain of the fate of the armada does it begin to grow and who can say if ever it will come to flower for this tidings has stirred me strangely 
bringing back my youth and the deeds of love and war and wild adventure which I have been mingled in, fighting for my own hand and for Guatemoc and the people of the Otomie against these same Spaniards, as they have not been brought back for many years. Indeed, it seems to me, and this is no rare thing with the aged, as though there in the far past my true life lay, and all the rest were nothing but a dream. From the window of the room wherein I write I can see the peaceful valley of the Waveney. Beyond its stream are the common lands golden with gorse, the ruined castle and the red roofs of the Bungay town gathered about the tower of St. Mary's Church. Yonder, far away, are the king's forests of Stowe, and, and the fields of Flixton Abbey. To the right, the steep bank is green with the Earsham oaks. To the left, the fast marshlands spotted with cattle stretch on to Beckles and Lowestoft while behind me my gardens and orchards rise in terraces up the Tuffery Hurl, that in old days was known as the Earl's Vineyard. All these are about me, and yet in this hour they are as though they were not. For the valley of the Waveney I see the Vale of Tenochtitlan, for the slopes of Stowe the snowy shapes of the Vulcans, Popo, and Istak, for the spire of Earsham, and the towers of Ditchingham, of Bungay and of Beckles, the soaring pyramids of the sacrifice gleaming with the sacred fires, and for the cattle in the meadows, the horsemen of Cortes sweeping to war. It comes back to me, that was life. The rest is but a dream. Once more I feel young, and should I be spared so long, I will set down the story of my, my youth before I am laid in yonder churchyard and lost in the world of dreams. Long ago I had begun it, but it was only in the last Christmas day that my dear wife died and while she lived I knew that this task was better left undone. Indeed, well, to be frank, it was thus with my wife. She loved me, I, I believe, as few men have the fortune to be loved, and there is love much in my past that jarred upon the love of hers, moving her to a jealousy of the dead that was not the less deep because it was so gentle and so closely coupled with forgiveness. For she had a secret sorrow that ate at her heart away, although she never spoke of it. But one child was born to us, and this child died in infancy. Nor for all her prayers did it please God to give her another, and indeed remembering the words of Otomie, I did not expect that it would be so. Now, she was, she knew well that yonder across the seas I had children, whom I loved by another wife, and though they were long dead, must always love unalterably, and this thought wrung her heart that I had been the husband of another woman she could forgive, but that this woman should have borne me children whose memory was still so dear, she could not forget if she forgave it. She who was childless. Why, it was so, being but a man, I cannot say, for who can know all the mystery of a loving woman's heart? But so it was. Once, indeed, we quarrelled on the matter. It was our only quarrel. 
it chanced that when we had been married but two years and our babe was some few days buried in the churchyard of this parish at ditchingham i dreamed a very vivid dream as i slept one night at my wife's side i dreamed that my dead children the four of them for the tallest lad bore in his arm my firstborn that infant who died in the great siege came to me as they had often come when i ruled the people of otomy in the city of pines and talked with me giving me flowers and kissing my hand i looked upon their strength and beauty and was proud at heart and in my dream it seemed as though some great sorrow had been lifted from my mind as though these dear ones had been lost and now were found again ah what misery is there like to this misery of dreams that can thus give us back our dead in mockery and then departing leave us with a keener woe well i dreamed on talking with my children in my sleep and naming them by my beloved names till at length i woke to look on emptiness and knowing all my sorrow i sobbed aloud now it was early morning and the light of the august sun streamed through the window but i deeming that my wife slept still lay in the shadow of my dream as it were and groaned murmuring the names of those whom i uh, i might never see again it chanced however that she was awake and I had overheard these words which i spoke with the dead while i was yet asleep and after and though some of this talk was in the tongue of the otomy the most was in english and knowing the names of my children she guessed the purport of it all suddenly she sprang from bed and stood over me and there was such anger in her eyes as i had never seen before nor had seen since nor did it last long but presently indeed it was quenched in tears what is it wife i asked astonished it is hard she answered that i must bear to listen to such talk from your lips husband was it in was it not enough that when all men thought you dead i wore my youth away faithful to your memory though how faithful you were to mine you know best did i ever reproach you because you had forgotten me and wedded a savage woman in a distant land oh never dear wife nor had i forgotten you as you know well but what i wonder at is that you should grow jealous now when all cause is done with cannot we be jealous of the dead with the living we may cope but who can fight against the love which death has completed sealing it for ever and making it immortal still that i forgive you for against the woman i can hold my own seeing that you were mine before you became hers and are mine after it but with the children it is otherwise they are hers and yours alone i have no part nor lot in them and whether they be dead or living i know well you love them always and will love them beyond the grave if you may find them there already i grow old who waited twenty years and more before i was your wife and i shall give you no other children one i gave you and god took it back lest i should be too happy yet its name was not on your lips with those strange names my dead babe is little to you husband here she choked bursting into tears nor did i think it well to answer her that there was this difference in the matter that whereas 
with the exception of one infant, those sons whom I had lost were almost adolescent. The babe she bore lived but sixty days. Now when the Queen first put in my mind to write down the history of my life, I remember this outbreak of my beloved wife, and seeing that I could write no true tale and leave out of it the story of her who is also my wife, Montezuma's daughter, Otomie, Princess of the Otomie, and of the children that she gave me, I let the matter lie. For I knew well that though we speak very rarely on the subject during all the many years we passed together, still it was always in Lily's mind. Nor did her jealousy, being of the finer sort, abate at all with age, but rather gathered with the gathering days. That I should execute the task without the knowledge of my wife would not have been possible, for till the very last she watched over my every act, and as I verily believe, divined the most of my thoughts. And so we grew old together, peacefully, and side by side, speaking seldom of that great gap in my life when we were lost to each other, and of all that then befell. At length the end came. My wife died suddenly in her sleep in the eighty-seventh year of her age. I buried her on the south side of the church here, with a sorrow indeed in my heart, but not with sorrow inconsolable, for I know that I must soon join her, and those others whom I have loved. There in that white heaven are my mother and my sister and my sons. There are great Guatemoc, my friend, last of the emperors, and many other companions in war who have preceded me to peace. There, too, though she doubted it, is Otomie, the beautiful and proud. In the heaven which I trust to reach, all the sins of my youth and the errors of my age notwithstanding, it is told us there is no marrying and giving in marriage, and this is well, for I do not know how my wives, Montezuma's daughter, and the sweet English gentlewoman, would agree together were it otherwise. And now to my task. End of chapter one. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter Two of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Of the Parentage of Thomas Wingfield. I, Thomas Wingfield, was born here at Ditchingham, and in this very room where I write to day. The house of my birth was built, or added to, early in the reign of the seventh Henry. But long before his time some kind of tenement stood here, which was lived in by the keeper of the vineyards, and known as Gardener's Lodge. Whether it chanced that the climate was more kindly in those old times, or the skill of those who tended the fields was greater, I do not know. But this, at least, is true that the hillside beneath which the house nestles, and which once was the bank of an arm of the sea or of a great broad, was a vineyard in Earl Bigard's days. Long since has it ceased to grow grapes, though the name of the Earl's vineyard still clings to all that slope of land which lies between this house and a certain health-giving spring that bubbles up from the bank and half of a mile away, in the waters of which sick folks come to bathe even from Norwich and Lowestoft. 
but sheltered as it is from the east winds to this hour the place has the advantage that gardens planted here are earlier by fourteen days than any others in the countryside and that a man may sit in them coatless in the bitter month of may when on the top of the hill not two hundred paces hence he must shiver in a jacket of otter skins the lodge for so it has always been named in its beginnings having been but a farmhouse faces to the southwest and is built so low that it might well be thought that the damp from the wo the river waveney which runs through the marshes close by would rise in it but this is not so for though in autumn the roke as here in norfolk we name the ground fog hangs about the house at nightfall and in seasons of great flood the water has been known to pour into the stables at the back of it yet being built on sand and gravel there is no healthier habitation in the parish for the rest of the building is of stud work and, and red brick quaint and mellow looking with many corners and gables that in summer are half hidden in roses and other creeping plants with its outlook on the marshes and the common where the lights vary continually with the seasons and even with the hours of the day on the red roofs of bungay town and on the wooded bank that stretches round the ersham lands though there are many larger to my mind there is none pleasanter in these parts here in this house i was born and here doubtless i shall die and having spoken of it at some length as we are wont to do of spots which long custom has endeared us to i will go on to tell of my parentage first then i would set out with a certain pride for who of us does not love an ancient name when we happen to be born to it that i am sprung from the family of the wingfields of wingfield castle in suffolk that lies some two hours on horseback from this place long ago the heiress of the wingfields married a de la pole a family famous in our history the last of whom edmund earl of suffolk lost his head for treason when i was young and the castle passed to the de la poles with her but some offshoots of the old wingfield stock lingered in the neighbourhood perchance there was a bar sinister on their coats of arms i know not and, and, and do not care to know at the least of my fathers and i are of this blood my grandfather was a shrewd man more of a yeoman than a squire though his birth was gentle he it was who brought this place with the lands around it and gathered up some fortune mostly by careful marrying and living for though he had but one son he was twice married and also by trading in cattle now my grandfather was godly minded even to superstition and strange as it may seem having only one son nothing would satisfy him but that boy should be made a priest but my father had little leaning towards the priesthood and life in a monastery though at all seasons my grandfather strove to reason it to into him sometimes with words and examples at other times with the thick cudgel of holly that still hangs over the ingle in the smaller sitting-room the end of it was that the lad was sent to the priory here at bungay where his conduct was of such nature that within a year the prior prayed his parents to take him back and set him in some way of secular life not only so said the prior did my father cause scandal by his actions breaking out of the priory at night and visiting drinking houses and other places but such was the sum of his wickedness he did not scruple to question and make mockery of the very doctrines of the church 
alleging even that there was nothing sacred of the image of the Virgin Mary which stood in the chancel, and shut its eyes in prayer before all the congregation when the priest elevated the host. Therefore, said the prior, I pray you to take back your son, and let him find some other road to the stake than that which runs through the gates of Bungay Priory. <laughs> now, at this story my grandfather was so enraged that he, f he almost fell into a fit. Then, recovering, he bethought him of his cudgel of holly, and would have used it. But my father, who was now nineteen years of age, and very stout and strong, twisted it from his hand, and flung it full fifty yards, saying that no man should touch him, more were he were a hundred times his father. Then he walked away, leaving the prior and my grandfather staring at each other. <laughs> now, to shorten the long tale, the end of the matter was this. It was believed both by my grandfather and the prior that the true cause of my father's contumacy was a passion which he had conceived for a girl of humble birth, a miller's fair daughter who dwelt at Wainford Wills. Perhaps there was truth in this belief, or perhaps there was none. What does it matter? Seeing that the maid married a butcher at Beckles and died years since at the good age of ninety and five? But true or false, my grandfather believed the tale, and knowing well that absence is the surest cure for love, he entered into a plan with the prior that my father should be sent to a monastery at Seville in Spain, of which the prior's brother was abbot and there learn to forget the miller's daughter and all other worldly things. When this was told to my father, he fell into it readily enough, being a young man of spirit and having a great desire to see the world, otherwise, however, than through the gratings of a monastery window. So the end of it was that he went to foreign parts in the care of a party of Spanish monks, who had journeyed here to Norfolk on a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Walshingham. It, it is said that my grandfather wept when he parted with his son, feeling that he should see him no more. Yet so strong was his religion, or rather his superstition, that he did not hesitate to send him away, though for no reason save than that he would mortify his own love and flesh offering his son for a sacrifice, as Abraham would have offered Isaac. But though my father appeared to consent to the sacrifice, as did Isaac, yet his mind was not altogether set on altars and faggots. In short, as he himself told me in years after, his plans were already laid. Thus it chanced that when he had sailed from Yarmouth a year and six months, there came a letter from the abbot of the monastery of Seville to his brother, the prior of St. Mary's at Bungay, saying that my father had fled from the monastery, leaving no trace wherever he had gone. My grandfather was grieved at this tidings, but he said little about it. Two more years passed, and there came other news, namely that my father had been captured, that he had been handed over to the power of the Holy Office, as the accursed Inquisition was then named, and tortured to death at Seville. Oh, when my grandfather heard this, he wept and bemoaned himself that his folly in forcing one into the church, who had no liking for that path, had brought about the shameful end of his only son. After that date, also he broke his friendship with the prior of St. Mary's at Bungay, and ceased offerings to the priory. Still he did not believe that my father was dead in truth, since on the last day of his own life that ended two years later. He spoke of him as a living man, 
and left messages to him as to the management of the lands which now were his. And in the end became clear that his belief was not ill-founded, for one day, three years after the old man's death, there landed at the port of Yarmouth none other than my father, who had been absent some eight years in all. Nor did he come alone, for with him he brought a wife, a young and very lovely lady, who afterwards was my mother. She was a Spaniard of noble family, having been born at Seville, and her maiden name was Donna Luisa de Garcia. Now, of all that befell my father during his eight years of wandering, I cannot speak certainly, for he was very silent on the matter, though I may have need to touch on some of his adventures, but I know it is true that he fell under the power of the Holy Office, for once, when he was a little lad, I bathed with him in the elbow pool, where the river Waveney bends some three hundred yards above the house. I saw that his breast and arms were scored with long white scars, and asked him what had caused them. I remember well how his face changed as I spoke, from kindliness to the hue of blackest hate, and how he answered speaking to himself rather than to me. Devils, he said, devils set on their work by the chief of all devils that live upon the earth and shall reign in hell. Hark you, my son, Thomas, there is a country called Spain where your mother was born, and there these devils abide who torture men and women, aye, and burn them living in the name of Christ. I was betrayed into their hands by him whom I name the chief of all devils, though he was younger than I am by three years, and their pincers and hot irons left these marks on me. Aye, and they would have burnt me alive also, only I escaped, thanks to your mother. But such tales are not for little lads' hearings. And see you never speak of them, Thomas, for the Holy Office has a long arm. You are half a Spaniard, Thomas. Your skin and eyes tell their own tale. But whatever skin and eyes may tell, let your heart give them the lie. Keep your heart English, Thomas. Let no foreign devilments enter here. Hate all Spanish except your mother, and be watchful, lest her blood should master mine within you. Oh, I was a child then, and scarcely understood his words, or what he meant by them. Afterwards I learned to understand them but too well, for as my father's counsel that I should conquer my Spanish blood, would that I could always have followed it, for I know that from his blood springs the most of such evil as in me. Hence come my fixedness of purpose, or rather obstinacy, and my powers of unchristian hatred that are not small towards those who have wronged me. Well, I have done what I might to overcome these and other faults, but strive as we may. That which is bred in the bone will out in the flesh, as I have seen in many signal instances. There were three of us children, Geoffrey, my elder brother, myself, and my sister Mary, who was one year my junior, the sweetest child and the most beautiful that I have ever known. We were very happy children, and our beauty was the pride of our father and mother, and the envy of other parents. I was the darkest of the three, dark indeed to swarthiness, but in Mary the Spanish blood showed only in her rich eyes of velvet hue, and in the glow upon her cheek that was like the, like the, the blush on a ripe fruit. My mother used to call me her little Spaniard, 
because of my swarthiness, that is, when my father was not near, for such names angered him. She never learned to speak English very well, but he would suffer her to talk in no other tongue before him. Still, when he was not there she spoke in Spanish, of which language, however, I alone of the family became a master, and that more because of certain volumes of old Spanish romances which she had by her, than for any other reason. From my earliest childhood I was fond of such tales, and it was by bribing me with the promise that I should read them that she persuaded me to learn Spanish. For my mother's heart still yearned towards her old sunny shore, and often she would talk of it with us children, more especially in the winter season, which she hated, well, as I do. Once I asked her if she wished to go back to Spain. She shivered and answered, Oh, no, for there dwelt one who was her enemy and would kill her. Also her heart with her, was with us children and our father. I wondered if this man who sought to kill my mother was the same as he, of whom my father had spoken of as the chief of the devils. But I only answered that no man could wish to kill one so good and beautiful. Ah, my boy, she said, it is just because I am, or rather have been, beautiful that he hates me. Others would have wedded me beside your dear father, Thomas. And her face grew troubled, as though with fear. Now, when I was eighteen and a half years old, on a certain evening in the month of May, it happened that a friend of my father's, Squire Bozard, late of the hall in this parish, called at the lodge on his road from Yarmouth and in the course of his talk let it fall that a Spanish ship was at an anchor in the roads, laden with merchandise. My father picked up his ears at this, and asked who her captain might be. Squire Bozard answered that he did not know his name, but that he had seen him in the market-place, a, a tall and stately man, richly dressed, with a handsome face and a scar upon his temple. At this news my mother turned pale beneath her olive skin, and muttered in Spanish, Holy Mother, grant that it may not be he. Well, my father also looked frightened, and questioned this squire closely as to the man's appearance, but without learning anything more. Then he bade adieu, with little ceremony, and taking horse, rode away for Yarmouth. Oh, that night my mother never slept, but sat all through it in her nursing chair, brooding over I know not what. As I left her when I went to bed, so I found her when I came from it at dawn. I can remember well, pushing the door ajar to see her face glimmering, glimmering white in the twilight of the May morning, as she sat, her large eyes fixed upon the lattice. "'You have risen early, mother,' I said. "'I have never lain down, Thomas,' she answered. "'Oh, why not? What do you fear?' "'I fear the past and the future, my son. Would that your father were back!' Well, about ten o'clock of that morning, as I was making ready to walk into Bungay to the house of that physician under whom I was learning the art of healing, my father rode up. My mother, who was watching at the lattice, ran out to meet him. Springing from his horse, he embraced her, saying, Be of good cheer, my sweet, it cannot be he. This man has another name. But did you see him? she asked. No, he was out at his ship for the night, and I hurried home to tell you, knowing your fears. It was sure if you had seen him, husband, he may well have taken another name. Oh, I never thought of that, sweet, my father answered, 
but have no fear should it be he and should he dare to set foot in this parish of ditchingham there are those who will know how to deal with him but i am sure that it is not he oh thanks be to jesus you then she said and they began talking in a low voice now seeing that i was not wanted i took my cudgel and started down the bridle path towards the common footbridge when suddenly my mother called me back oh kiss me before you go thomas she said you must wonder what all this may mean one day your father will tell you it has to do with a shadow which has hung over my life for so many years but that is i trust gone for ever if it be a man who flings it he had best keep out of this reach of this i said laughing and shaking my thick stick oh it is a man she answered but one to be dealt with otherwise than by blows thomas should you ever come to chance to meet him may be mother but might is the best argument at the last for the most cunning have a life to lose you are too ready to use your strength son she said smiling and kissing me remember the old spanish proverb he strikes hardest who strikes last and remember the other proverb mother strike before thou art stricken i answered and went when i had gone some ten paces something prompted me to look back i know not what my mother was standing by the open door her stately shape framed as it were in the flowers of a white creeping shrub that grew upon the wall of the old house as was her custom she wore a mantilla of white lace upon her head the ends of which were wound beneath her chin and the arrangement of it was such that at this distance for one moment it put me in mind of the wrappings which are now placed about the dead i started at this thought and looked at her face she was watching me with sad and earnest eyes that seemed to be filled with the spirit of farewell i never saw her again till she was dead The end of chapter two. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter three of Montezuma's Daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 3 The Coming of the Spaniard And now I must go back and speak of my own matters. As I have told you, it was my father's wish that I should be a physician, and since I came back from my schooling at Norwich, that was when I had entered on my sixteenth year, I had studied medicine under a doctor who practised his art in the neighbourhood of Bungay. He was a very learned man, and an honest, Grimstone by name, and as I had some liking for the business, I made good progress under him. Indeed, I had learned almost all that he could teach me, and my father purposed to send me to London, there to push on my studies so soon as i should attain my twentieth year that is within some five months of the date of the coming of the spaniard but it was not fated that i should go to london medicine was not the only thing that i studied in those days however squire bozard of ditchingham the same who told my father of the coming of the spanish ship had two living children a son and a daughter though his wife had borne him many more who died in infancy. The daughter was named Lily, and of my own age, having been born three weeks after me in the same year. Now the Bozards are gone from these parts, for my great-niece, the granddaughter, 
and sole heiress of this son, has married and is issue of another name. But this is by the way. From our earliest days we children, Bozards and Wingfields, lived almost as brothers and sisters, for day by day we met and played together in the snow or in the flowers. Thus it would be hard for me to say when I began to love Lily, or when she began to love me. But I know that when first I went to school at Norwich, I grieved more at losing sight of her than because I must part from my mother and the rest. In all our games she was ever my partner, and I would search the country round for days to find such flowers as she chanced to love. When I came back from school it was the same, though by degrees Lily grew shyer, and I also grew suddenly shy, perceiving that from a child she had become a woman. Still we met often, and though neither of us said anything of it, it was sweet to us to meet. Thus things went on till this day of my mother's death. But before I go further, I must tell that Squire Bozard looked with no favour of friendship between his daughter and myself, and this not because he disliked me, but rather because he would have seen Lily wedded to my elder brother Geoffrey, my father's heir, and not to a younger son. So hard did he grow about the matter at last that we two might scarcely meet except by seeming accident, whereas my brother was we was ever welcome at the hall. And on this account some bitterness arose between us as brothers, as is apt to be in the case when a woman comes between friends, however close. For it must be known that my brother Geoffrey also loved Lily, as all men would have loved her, and with a better right perhaps than I had, for he was my elder by three years, and born to possessions. It might seem indeed that I was somewhat hasty to fall into this state, seeing that at that time, of which I write, I was not yet of age. But young blood is nimble, and moreover mine was half Spanish and made a man of me, when many a pure-bred Englishman is still nothing but a boy. For the blood and the sun that ripens it have much to do with such matters, as I have seen often enough among the Indian peoples of Anahuac, who at the age of fifteen will take themselves a bride of twelve. At least it is certain that when I was eighteen years old, I was old enough to fall in love after such fashion that I never fell out of it again altogether. Although the history of my life may seem to give me the lie when I say so. But I take it that a man may love several women, and yet love one of them the best of all, being true in the spirit to the law which he breaks in the letter. Now, when I had attained nineteen years, I was a man full grown, and writing as I do in extreme old age, I may say it without false shame, a very handsome youth, note to boot. I was not over tall indeed, measuring but five feet nine inches and a half in height, but my limbs were well made, and I was both deep and broad in the chest. In colour I was, and my white hair notwithstanding, am still extraordinary dark-hued. My eyes were also large and dark, and my hair, which was waxy and wavy, was coal-black. In my deportment I was reserved and grave to sadness, in speech I was slow and temperate, and more apt at listening than in talking. I weighed matters well before I made up my mind about them, but being made up, nothing could turn me from that mind short of death itself, whether it were set on good or evil, on folly or wisdom. In those days also, 
I had little religion, since, partly because of my father's secret teaching, and partly through the workings of my own reason, I had learned that to doubt the doctrines of the church as they used to be set out. Youth is prone to reason by large leaps, as it were, and to hold that all things are false because some are proved false, and thus at times, in those days, I thought there was no God, because the priests said that the image of the Virgin of Bungay wept, and did other things which I knew that it did not do. Now, I know well that there is a God, for my own story proves it to the heart. In truth, what man can look back across a long life and say there is no God? When he can see the shadow of his hand lying deep upon the tale of years. On this sad day of which I write, I knew that Lily, whom I loved, would be walking alone beneath the great pollard oaks of the park of Ditchingham Hall. Here, in Grubswell, as the spot is called, grew, and indeed still grow, certain hawthorn trees that are the earliest to blow of any of these parts, and when we had met at the church door on Sunday, Lily said that there would be bloom upon them by the Wednesday, and on that afternoon she would go out and cut it. It may well be that she spoke thus with design, for love will breed cunning in the heart of the most guileless and truthful maid. Moreover, I noticed that, though she said it before her father and the rest of us, yet she waited to speak till my brother Geoffrey was out of hearing, for she did not wish to go maying with him, and also that as she spoke she shot a glance of her grey eyes at me. Then and there I vowed to myself that I would also be gathering hawthorn bloom in this same place, and on that Wednesday afternoon, yes, even if I must play truant and leave all the sick of Bungay to nature's nursing. Moreover, I was determined on one thing, that if I could find Lily alone, I would delay no longer, but tell her all that was in my heart. No great secret, indeed, for though no word of love had ever passed between us as yet, each knew the other's hidden thoughts. Not that I was in a way to become a fiancée to a maid who had my path to cut in the world, but I feared that if I delayed to make sure of her affection, my brother would be there before me with her father, and Lily might yield to that to which she would not yield if once we had plighted troth. Now, it chanced that on this afternoon I was hard put to escape to my tryst, for my master, the physician, was ailing and sent me to visit the sick for him, carrying them their medicines. At the last, however, between four and five o'clock, I fled, asking no leave. Taking the Norwich Road, I ran for a mile and more till I had passed the manor house and the church turn, and drew near to Ditchingham Park. Then I dropped my pace to a walk, for I did not wish to come before Lily heated and disordered, but rather looking my best, to which end I had put on my Sunday garments. Now, as I went down the little hill in the road that turns past the park, I saw a man on horseback who looked first at the bridle path that at his spot turns off to the right, then back across the common lands towards the vineyard hills and the Waveney, and then along the road as though he did not know which way to turn. I was quick to notice things, though at this moment my mind was not at its swiftest being set on other matters, and chiefly as to how I should tell my tale to Lily and I saw at once that this man was not of our country. He was a very tall and noble-looking, dressed in rich garments of velvet, 
adorned by a gold chain that hung about his neck, and as I judged, were about forty years of age. But it, it was his face which chiefly caught my eye, for at that moment there was something terrible about it. It was long, thin, and deeply carved. The eyes were large and gleamed like gold in the sunlight. The mouth was small and well-shaped, but it wore a devilish and cruel sneer. The forehead lofty, indicating a man of mind, and marked with a slight scar. For the rest, the cavalier was dark and southern-looking. His curling hair, like my own, was black, and he wore a peat-chestnut-coloured beard. By the time that I had finished these observations, my feet had brought me almost to the stranger's side, and for the first time he caught sight of me. Instantly his face changed. The sneer left it, and it became kindly and pleasant-looking. Lifting his bonnet with much courtesy, he stammered something in broken English, of which all that I could catch was the word Yarmouth. Then, perceiving that I did not understand him, he cursed the English tongue and all those who spoke it, aloud, and in good Castilian. "'If the signor will graciously express his wish in Spanish,' I said, speaking in that language, "'it may be in my power to help him.' "'What? You speak Spanish, young sir?' he said, starting. "'And yet you are not a Spaniard, though by your face you may well be. "'Caramba! But it is strange!' "'And he eyed me most curiously. "'It may be strange, sir,' I answered, "'but I am in haste. "'Be pleased to ask your question and let me go.' "'Ah!' he said. Perhaps I can guess the reason for your hurry. I saw a white robe down by the streamlet yonder, and he nodded towards the park. Take the advice of an older man, young sir, and be careful. Make what sport you will with such, but never believe them and never marry them, lest you should live to desire to kill them. Well, here I made as though I would pass on, but he spoke again. Ah, pardon my words, they were well meant, and perhaps you may come to learn their truth. I will detain you no more. Will you graciously direct me on the road to Yarmouth? For I am not sure of it, having ridden by another way, and your English country is so full of trees that a man cannot see a mile. I walked a dozen paces down the bridle path that joined the road to this place, and pointed out the way that he should go, past Ditchingham Church. As I did so, I noticed that while I spoke, the stranger was watching my face keenly, and as it seemed to me, with an inward fear which he strove to master and could not. When I had finished again, he raised his bonnet and thanked me, saying, "'Will you be so gracious as to tell me your name, young sir?' "'What is my name to you?' I answered roughly, "'for I dislike this man. "'You have not told me yours?' "'Oh, no. "'Indeed, I am travelling incognito. "'Perhaps I also met a lady in these parts.' "'And he smiled strangely. "'I only wished to know the name of one who had done me a courtesy, but who, it seems, is not so courteous as I deemed. And he shook his horse's rein. I am not ashamed of my name, I said. It has been an honest one so far, and if you wish to know it, it is Thomas Wingfield. I thought it, he cried, and as he spoke his face grew like the face of a fiend. Then before I could find time even to wonder, he had sprung from his horse and stood within three paces of me. A lucky day! Now we will see what truth there is in prophecies, he said, drawing his silver-mounted sword. A name for a name, Juan de Garcia, gives you greetings, Thomas Wingfield. 
Now, strange as it may seem, it was at this moment only that there flashed across my mind the thought of all that I had heard about the Spanish stranger, the report of whose coming to Yarmouth had stirred my father and mother so deeply. At any other time I should have remembered it soon enough, but on this day I was so set upon my tryst with Lily, and what I should say to her, that nothing else could hold a place in my thoughts. "'This must be the man,' I said to myself, and then I said no more, for he was upon me, soared up. I saw the keen point flash towards me, and sprang to one side, having a desire to fly, but, as being unarmed except for my stick, I might have done without shame. But spring as I would, I could not avoid the thrust altogether. It was aimed at my heart, and it pierced the sleeve of my left sleeve, of my arm, passing through the flesh. No more. Yet at the pain of that cut, all thought of flight left me, and instead of it a cold anger filled me, causing me to wish to kill this man who had attacked me thus, and unprovoked. In my hand was my stout oaken staff, which I had cut myself at the banks of Hollow Hill, and if I would fight I must make such play with this as I might. It seems a poor weapon indeed to match against a Toledo blade in the hands of one who could handle it well, and yet there are virtues in a cudgel, for when a man sees himself threatened with it, he is likely to forget that he holds in his hand a more deadly weapon, and to take to the guarding of his own head in place of running his adversary through the body. And that is what chanced in this case though how it came about exactly I cannot tell. The Spaniard was a fine swordsman, and had I been armed as he was, would doubtless have overmatched me, who at that age had no practice in the art, which was almost unknown in England. But when he saw the big stick flourished over him, he forgot his own advantage, and raised his arm to, to ward away the blow. Down it came upon the back of the hand, and lo, his sword fell from it to the grass. But I did not spare him because of that, for my blood was up. The next stroke took him on the lips, knocking out a tooth and sending him backwards. Then I caught him by the leg and beat him most unmercifully, not upon the head indeed, for now that I was victor I did not wish to kill one whom I thought was a madman, as I would have done. Then I caught him by the leg and beat him most unmercifully, not upon the head indeed. For now that I was victor I did not wish to kill one whom I thought a madman as I would that I had done, but on every other part of him. Indeed, I thrashed him till my arms were weary, and then I fell to kicking him, and all the while he writhed like a wounded snake and cursed me horribly though he never cried out or asked for mercy. At last I ceased and looked at him, and he was no pretty sight to see. Oh, indeed, what with his cuts and bruises and the mire of the roadway, it would have been hard to know him for the gallant cavalier whom I had met not five minutes before. But uglier than all his certs was the look in his wicked eyes as he lay there on the road, on the pathway, and glared up at me. "'Now, friend Spaniard,' I said, "'you have learned a lesson, and what is there to hinder me from treating you, as you would have dealt with me, who had never harmed you?' And I took up his sword, and held it to his throat. "'Strike home, you accursed whelp,' he answered in a broken voice. "'It is better to die than to live to remember such shame as this.' No, said I, I am no foreign murderer to kill a defenceless man. You shall away to the justice to answer for yourself. The hangman is a rope for such as you. Then you must drag me hither, he groaned, and shut his eyes as though with faintness, and doubtless he was somewhat faint. 
Now, as I pondered on what should be done with the villain, it chanced that I looked up through a gap in the fence, and there, among the grubs while oaks, three hundred yards or more away, I caught sight of a flutter of a white robe that I knew well, and it seemed to me that the wearer of that robe was moving towards the bridge of the watering, as though she were weary of waiting for one who did not come. Then I thought to myself that if I stayed to drag this man to the village stocks or some other safe place, there would be an end to meeting with my love that day, and I did not know when I might find another chance. Now, I would not have missed that hour's walk with Lily to bring a score of murderous-minded foreigners to their deserts, and, moreover, this one had earned a good payment for his behaviour. Surely, thought I, he might wait a while till I had done my love-making, and if he would not wait, I would find a means to make him do so. Not twenty paces from us, the hall stood cropping the grass. I went with him, and undid his bridle rein, and with it fastened the Spaniard to the small wayside tree as best I was able. "'Now here you stay,' I said, "'till I am ready to fetch you.' and I turned to go. But as I went, a great doubt took me, and once more I remembered my mother's fear, and how my father had ridden in haste to Yarmouth on business about a Spaniard. Now today a Spaniard had wandered to Ditchingham, and when he learned my name had fallen upon me, madly trying to kill me, was not this the man whom they, my mother feared, and was it right that I should leave him thus, that I might go maying with my dear? I knew in my breast that it was not right, but I was so set upon my desire, and so strongly did my heart-strings pull me towards her, whose white robe now fluttered in the slope of the park hill, that I never heeded the warning. Well had it been for me if I had done so, and well for some who were yet unborn. Then they had never known death, nor I the land of exile, the taste of slavery, and the altar of sacrifice. End of chapter 3 Read by Patrick 79《Chapter Four of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter Four Thomas Tells His Love. Having made the Spaniard as fast as I could, his arms being bound to the tree behind him, and taking his sword with me, I began to run hard after Lily, and caught her not too soon, for in one more minute she would have turned along the path that runs to the watering, and over the bridge by the Park Hill path to the hall. Hearing my footsteps, she faced about to greet me, or rather as though to see who it was that followed her. There she stood in the evening light, a bough of hawthorn bloom in her hand, and my heart beat yet more wildly at the sight of her. Never had she seemed fairer than as she stood thus in her white robe, a look of amaze upon her face and in her grey eyes, oh, that was half real and half feigned, and with the sunlight shifting on her auburn hair that showed beneath her little bonnet. Lily was no round-check country maid with few beauties, save those of her health and youth, but a tall and shapely lady, who had ripened early to her full grace and sweetness. And so it came about that though we were almost of an age, yet in her present I felt always as though I were the younger. Thus in my love for her was mingled some touch of reverence. "'Oh, it's you, Thomas,' she said, blushing as she spoke. "'I thought you were not. I mean, that I'm going home as it grows late. "'But say, 
why do you run so fast and what has happened to you thomas that your arm is bloody and you carry a sword in your hand i have no breath as yet to speak i answered come back to the hawthorns and i will tell you no i must be wending homewards i have been among the trees for more than an hour and there is little bloom upon them i could not come before linny i was kept in a strange manner also i saw bloom as i ran oh indeed i never thought that you would come thomas she answered looking down who have other things to do other than go out maying with a girl like me but i wish to hear your story if it is short and i will walk a little way with you so we turned and walked side by side towards the great pallard oaks and by the time we reached them i had told her the tale of the spaniard and how he strove to kill me and how i had beaten him with my staff now lily listened eagerly enough and sighed with fear when she learned how close i had been to death but you are wounded thomas she broke in see the blood runs fast from your arm is the thrust deep <laughs> i have not looked yet to see i have had no time to look oh take off your coat thomas and i may dress the wound nay i will have it so so i drew off the garment without pain and rolled up the shirt beneath and there was hurt a clean thrust through the fleshy part of the lower arm lily washed it with water from the brook and bound it with her handkerchief murmuring words of pity all the time to say truth i would have suffered a worse harm gladly if only i could find her to tend it indeed her gentle care broke down the fence of my doubts and gave me a courage that otherwise might have failed me in her presence at first indeed i could find no words but as she bound my wound i bent down and kissed her ministering hand oh she flushed red as the evening sky the flood of crimson losing itself at last beneath her auburn hair but it burned deepest upon the white hand which i had kissed oh, why did you do that thomas she said in a low voice then i spoke i did it because i love you lily and do not know how to begin telling of my love i love you dear and have always loved as i always shall are you so sure of that thomas she said again there is nothing else in the world of which i am so sure lily what i wish to be as sure of is that you love me as i love you for a moment she stood quiet her head sunk almost to her breast then she lifted it and her eyes shone as i had never seen them shine before can you doubt it thomas she said and now i took her in my arms and kissed her on the lips and the memory of that kiss has gone with me through my long life and is with me yet when old and withered i stand upon the borders of the grave it was the greatest joy that has been given to me in all my days too soon alas it was done that first pure kiss of youthful love and i spoke again somewhat aimlessly it, it seems then that you do not love me who love you so well if you doubted it before can you doubt it now she answered very softly but listen thomas it is well that we should love each other for we we were born to it and have no help in the matter even if we wish to find it still though love be sweet and holy it is not all for there is duty to be thought of and what will my father say of this thomas i do not know lily and yet i can guess i am sure sweet that he wishes you to take my brother geoffrey and leave me on one side 
then his wishes are not mine thomas also though duty be strong it is not strong enough to force a woman to a marriage for which she has no liking yet it may prove strong enough to keep a woman from a marriage for which her heart pleads perhaps also it should have been strong enough to hold me back from telling of my love no lily the love itself is much and though it should bring no fruit still it is something we have won it for ever and a day you were very young to talk thomas i am also young i know but we women ripen quicker perhaps all this is but a boy's fancy to pass with boyhood it will never pass lily they say that our first loves are the longest and that which is sown in youth will flourish in our age listen lily i have my place to make in the world and it may take me time in the making and i ask one promise of you though perhaps it is a selfish thing to seek i ask of you that you will be faithful to me and come fair weather or foul will wed no other man till you know me dead it is something to promise thomas for with time comes changes still i am so sure of myself that i promise nay i swear it of you i cannot be sure but things are so with us women that we must risk all upon a throw and if we lose well good-bye her happiness then we talked on and i cannot remember what we said though these words that i have written down remain in my mind partly because of their own weight and in part because of all that came about in the after years and at last i knew that i must go though were we were sad enough at parting so i took in my arms and kissed her so closely that some blood from my wound ran down her white attire but as we embraced i chanced to look up and a sore sight that frightened me enough for there were not five paces from us stood squire bozard lily's father watching all and his face wore no smile he had been riding up by the bridle path to a watering ford and seeing a couple trespassing beneath the oaks dismounted from his horse to hunt them away not till he was quite near did he know whom he came to hunt and then he stood still in astonishment lily and i drew slowly apart and looked at him he was a short stout man with a red face and stern grey eyes that seemed to be starting from his head with anger for a while he could not speak but when he began at length his words came fast enough all that he said i forgot but the upshot of it was that he desired to know what my business was with his daughter i waited till he was out of breath then answered him and lily and i loved each other well and were plighting our troth is this so daughter he asked it is so my father she answered boldly then he broke out swearing you light minx he said you should be whipped and kept cool on bread and water in your chamber and as for you my half-bred spanish cockle know once and for all that this maid is for your betters how dare you come wooing my daughter you empty pillbox who have not two silver pennies to rattle in your pouch go win a fortune and a name before you dare look up to who she is that is my desire i will do it sir i answered so you apothecary's drudge you will win name and place will you well long before that deed is done that maid shall be safely wedded to one who has them and who is not unknown to you daughter say now that you have finished with him i cannot say that father she replied plucking at her robe if it is not your will that i should marry thomas here my duty is plain that i may not wed him but i am my own and no duty can make me marry where i will not while thomas lives i am sworn to him and to no other man at least you have courage hussy said her father but listen now either you will marry where and when i wish or tramp it for your bread 
ungrateful girl. Did I breed you to flaunt me to my face? Now for you, Pillbox. I will teach you to come kissing honest men's daughter without their leave. And with a curse he rushed at me, stick aloft to thrash me. And for the second time that day my quick blood boiled in me, and snatching up my Spaniard's sword that lay upon the grass beside me, I held it at the point, for the game was changed, and I who fought with cudgel against sword must now fight with sword against cudgel. And it had it not been for Lily with a quick cry of fear struck my arm from beneath, causing the point of the sword to pass over his shoulder. I believe that truly that I should then and there have pierced a father through, and ended my days early with a noose around my neck. "'Are you mad?' she cried. "'And do you think to win me by slaying my father? Throw down that sword, Thomas! As for winning you, it seems that there is small chance of it,' I answered hotly. "'But I tell you this. Not for the sake of all the maids upon the earth will I stand to be beaten with a stick like a scullion. And there I do not blame you, lad, said her father more kindly. I see that you have courage which may serve you in good stead, and it was unworthy of me to call you pillbox in my anger. Still, as I said, the girl is not for you, so be gone and forget her as best you may and if you value your life, never let me find you two kissing again. And know that tomorrow I will have a word with your father on this matter. I will go since I must go, I answered. But, sir, I still hope to live to call your daughter wife. Lily, farewell to these storms are overpast. Farewell, Thomas she said, weeping. Forget me not, and I will never forget my oath to you. Then, taking Lily by her arm, her father led her away. I also went away, sad, but not altogether ill-pleased. For now I knew that if I had won the father's anger, I had also the won the daughter's unalterable love and love lasts longer than wrath, and here or hereafter will win its way at length. When I had gone a little distance, I remembered the Spaniard, who had been clean forgotten by me in all this love and war, and I turned to seek him and drag him to the stocks, the which I should have done with joy, and being glad to find someone on whom to wreak my wrongs. But when I came to the spot where I had left him, I found that fate had befriended him by the hand of a fool, for there was no Spaniard but only the village idiot, Billy Minns by name, who stood staring first at the tree to which the foreigner had been made fast, and then at a piece of silver in his hand. "'Where is the man who I tied here, Billy?' I asked. I know not, Master Thomas, he answered in his Norfolk talk, which I will not set down. Halfway to wheresoever he was going, I should say, measured by the pace at which he left, when once I had set him upon his horse. You set him upon his horse, fool! How long ago was that? How long? Well, it might be one hour, or it might be be too. I no reckoning for time that keeps its own score like an innkeeper without my help. Halloks! How he did gallop off, working those long spurs he wore right into the ribs of the horse. And little wonder, poor man, and he daft, not able to speak but only to bleat sheep-like, and fallen upon by robbers on the king's road, and in broad daylight. But Billy cut him loose, and caught his horse, and set him upon it, and got his peace for his good charity. Looks! But he was glad to be gone. Oh, 
how he did gallop. Now you are a bigger fool even than I thought you, Billy Minns, I said in anger. That man would have murdered me. I overcame him and made him fast, and you have let him go. He would have murdered you, master, and you made him fast. Then why did you not stop to keep him till I came along, and we could have hailed him to the stocks? That would have been sport and all. You call me fool, but if you found a man covered with blood and hurts tied to a tree, and he daft and not able to speak, had you not cut him loose? Well, he's gone, and this alone is left of him. And he spun the piece into the air. Now, seeing that there was no reason in Billy's talk, for the fault was mine, I turned away without more words, not straight homewards, for I wished to think alone a while on all that had come about between me and Lily and her father. But down the way which runs across the lane, to the crest of the vineyard hills. These hills are clothed with underwood, in which large oaks grow to within some two hundred yards of the house where I write, and this underwood is pierced by paths that my mother laid out, for she loved to walk there. One of those paths runs along the bottom of the hill by the edge of the pleasant river Waveney, and the other, a hundred feet or more above, and near the crest of the slope, or to speak more plainly, there is but one path shaped like the letter O placed on its side, the curved ends of the letter marking how the path turns upon the hillside. Now I struck the path at the end that is furthest from the house, and followed that half of it which runs down by the river bank, having the water on one side of it and the brushwood upon the other. Along this lower path I wandered, my eyes fixed upon the ground, thinking deeply as I went, now of the joys of Lily's love, and now of the sorrow of our parting and of her father's wrath. As I went, thus wrapped in meditation, I saw something white lying upon the grass, and pushed it aside with the point of the Spaniard's sword, not heeding it. Still, its shape and its fashioning remained in my mind, and when I had left it some three hundred paces behind me, and was drawing near to the house, the sight of it came back to me as it lay soft and white upon the grass, and I knew it was familiar to my eyes. From the thing, whatever it might be, my mind passed to the Spaniard's sword, with which I had tossed it aside, and from the sword to the man himself. What had been his business in this parish? An ill one, surely. And why had he looked as though he feared me, and fallen upon me when he learned my name? I stood still, looking downward, and my eyes fell upon footprints dead, stamped in the wet sand of the path. One of them was my mother's, I, I could have sworn to it among a thousand, for no other woman in these parts had so delicate a foot. Close to it, as though following after, was another that at first I thought must have been made by a woman. It was so narrow, but presently I saw that this could scarcely be, because its length and moreover that the boot which left it was like none that I knew, being cut very high in the instep and very pointed at the toe. Then, of a sudden, it came upon me that the Spanish stranger wore such boots, for I had noted them while I talked with him, and that his feet were following those of my mother, for they had trodden on her track, and in some places his alone had stamped their impress on the sand, blotting out her footprints. Then, too, I knew that the white rag that I had thrown aside, it was my mother's mantilla which I knew and yet did not know, because I always saw it set daintily upon her head. In a moment it had come home to me, and with the knowledge a keen and sickening dread. 
why hath this man followed my mother and why did her mantilla lie upon the ground i turned and sped like the deer to where i had seen the lace all the way the footprints went before me now i was there yes the wrapping was her and it had been rent through by the rude hand but where was she with a beating heart once more i bent to read the writing of the footsteps here they were mixed with one another as though the two had stood close together moving now this way and now that in struggle i looked up the path but there were none then i cast round about like a beagle first along the river side then up the bank here they were again and made my feet that flew and feet that followed up the bank they went fifty yards and more now lost where the turf was sound now seen in the sand or loam till they led to the bowl of the big oak and were once more mixed together for here the pursuer had come up with the pursued despairingly as one who dreams for now i guessed all and grew mad with fear i looked this way and that till at length i found more footsteps those of the spaniards these were deep marked as of a man who carried some heavy burden i followed them first they went down the hill towards the river then turned aside to a spot where the brushwood was thick in the deepest of the clump the boughs now bursting into leaf were bent downwards as though to hide something beneath i wrenched them aside and there gleaming whitely in the gathering twilight was the dead face of my mother End of chapter 4 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 5 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 5 Thomas Swears an Oath. For a while I stood amazed with horror, staring down at the dead face of my beloved mother. Then I stooped to lift her and saw that she had been stabbed and through the breast stabbed with the sword which i carried in my hand now i understood this was the work of the spanish stranger whom i had met as he hurried from the place of murder who because of the wickedness of his heart or some secret reason had striven to slay me also when he learned that i was my mother's son and I had held this devil in my power, and that I might meet my May. I had suffered him to escape my vengeance, whom, had I known the truth, would have dealt with him as the priests of Anahuac deal with the victims of their gods. I understood, and shed tears of pity, rage, and shame then i turned and fled homeward like one mad at the doorway i met my father and my brother geoffrey riding up from bungay market and there was written on my face which had caused them to ask as one with one voice what evil thing had happened thrice i looked at my father before i could speak for i fear that lest the blow should kill him but speak I must at last, though I chose it should be to my brother, Geoffrey. Our mother lies murdered yonder in the vineyard hill. A Spanish man has done the deed, Juan de Garcia by name. Oh, when my father heard these words, his face became livid, as though with pain of the heart his jaw fell, and a low moan issued from his open mouth presently he rested his hand upon the pommel of the saddle and lifted his ghastly face and said where is this spaniard have you killed him no father he chanced upon me in grubswell and when he learned my name he would have murdered me but i played quarter-staff with him and beat him to a pulp taking his sword ay and then and then i let him go knowing nothing of the deed he had already wrought upon our mother though afterwards i will tell you all 
you let him go son you let juan de garcia go then thomas may the curse of god rest upon you till you find him and finish that which you began to-day oh spare to curse me father who am accursed by my own conscience turn your horses rather and ride for yarmouth for there his ship lies and thither he has gone within two hours perhaps you may still trap him before he sets sail oh, without another word my father and brother wheeled their horses round and departed at full gallop into the gloom of the gathering night they rode so fiercely that the horses being good they came to the gates of yarmouth in little more than an hour and a half and that is fast riding but the bird was flown they tracked him to the quay and found that he had shipped a while before in a boat which was in waiting for him and passed to his vessel that lay on the roads at anchor but with most of the canvas set instantly she sailed and now was lost in the night then my father caused notice to be given that he would pay reward of two hundred pieces in gold to any ship that should capture the spaniard and two started on the quest but they did not find her that before morning was far on her way across the sea so soon as they had galloped away i called together the grooms and other serving men and told them what had chanced then we held with lanterns for by now it was dark and came to the thick brushwood where lay the body of my mother i drew near the first for the men were afraid and so indeed was i though why i should fear her lying dead who living had loved me tenderly i do not know yet i know this that when I came to the spot and saw two eyes glowering out at me, and heard the crash of bushes as sometimes broke them, I could almost have fallen with fear, although I knew well that it was but a fox, or wandering hound, haunting the place of death. Still I went on, calling the others to follow, and the end of it was that we laid my mother's body upon a door, which had been lifted from its hinges and bore her home for the last time and to me that path is still a haunted place it is seventy years and more since my mother died by the hand of juan de garcia her cousin yet old as i am and hardened as such to sad scenes i do not love to walk that path alone at night doubtless it was fancy which plays us strange tricks Still, but a year ago, having gone to set a springe for a woodcock, I chanced to pass by yonder big oak upon a November eve, and I could have sworn that I saw it all again. I saw myself a lad, my wounded arm, still bound by Lily's kerchief, climbing slowly down the hillside, while behind me, groaning underneath their burden, were the forms of the four serving men i heard the murmur of the wind and the river that, that seventy years ago whispered in the reeds i saw the clouded sky floored here and there with blue and broken light that gleamed on the white burden stretched upon the door and the red stain at its breast i i heard myself talk as i went forward with a lantern bidding the men pass to the right of some steep and rotten ground and it was strange to me to listen to my own voice as it had been in youth well well it was but a dream yet such slaves are we to the fears of fancy that because of the dead i who am almost of their number do not love to pass that path at night at length we came home with our burden and the women took it weeping and set about their task with it and now i must not only fight my own sorrows but must strive to soothe those of my sister mary who as i feared would go mad with grief and horror at last she sobbed herself into a torpor and i went and questioned the men who sat round the fire of the kitchen 
for none had sought their beds that night. From them I learned that an hour or more before I met the Spaniard, a richly dressed stranger had been seen walking along a church path, that he had tied his horse among some gorse and brambles on the top of the hill where he stood as though in doubt, till my mother came out, when he descended and followed her. Also I learned that one of the men at work in the garden, which is not more than three hundred paces from where the deed was done, heard cries, but had taken no note of them, thinking forsooth that it was but the play of some lovers from Bungay, and his last cha chasing each other through the woods, as to this hour it is their fashion to do. Truly it seems to me that day as though this parish of Ditchingham were the very nursery of fools, of whom I was the first and the biggest, and indeed this same thought has struck me since concerning other matters. At length the morning came, and with it my father and brother, who returned from Yarmouth on hired horses, for their own were spent. In the afternoon also some news followed them that the ships which had put to sea on the track of the Spaniard had been driven back by bad weather, having seen nothing of him. Now I told all the story of my dealings with the murderer of my mother, keeping nothing back, and I must bear my father's bitter anger, because, knowing that my mother was in dread of a Spaniard, I had suffered my reason to be led astray by my desire to win speech with my love. Nor did I meet with any comfort from my brother Geoffrey, who was fierce against me, because he learned that I had not pleaded in vain with the maid whom he desired for himself. But he said nothing of this reason. Also, that no drop might be lacking in my cup, Squire Bozard, who came with many other neighbours to view the corpse and offer sympathy with my father in his loss, told him at the same time that he took it ill that I should woo his daughter against his wish, and that if I continue with this course it would strain their ancient friendship. Thus I was hit on every side, by sorrow for my mother, whom I had loved tenderly, by longing for my dear, whom I might not see, by self-reproach, because I had let the Spaniard go when I held him fast, and by the anger of my father and my brother. Indeed, those days were so dark and bitter for I was at the age when shame and sorrow sting their sharpest, that I wished that I were dead beside my mother. One comfort reached me indeed, a message from Lily sent by her servant girl, girl who she trusted, giving me her dear love and bidding me to be of good cheer. At length came the day of burial and my mother, wrapped in fair white robes, was laid to her rest in the chancel of the church at Ditchingham, where my father has long been set beside her, hard by the brass effigies that marked the burying place of Lily's forefather, his wife, and many of their children. This funeral was the saddest of sights, for the bitterness of my father's grief broke from him in sobs, and my sister Mary swooned away in my arms. Indeed, there were few dry eyes in all that church, for my mother, notwithstanding her foreign birth, was much loved because of her gentle ways and the goodness of her heart. But it came to an end, and the noble Spanish lady and English wife had left her to long sleep in the ancient church, where she shall rest on when her tragic story and her very name are forgotten among men. Indeed this is likely to be soon, for I am the last of the Wingfields alive in these parts, although my, my sister Mary has left descendants of another name, to whom my lands and fortune go except for certain gifts to the poor of Bungay and of Ditchingham. 
When it was over, I went back home. My father was sitting in the front room, well nigh beside himself with grief, and by him was my brother. Presently he began to assail me with bitter words, because I had let the murderer go when God gave him into my hand. "'You forget, father,' sneered Geoffrey. "'Thomas woos a maid, and it was more of him to hold her in his arms than to keep his mother's murderer safely. But by this it seems he was killed two birds with one stone. He has suffered the Spanish devil to escape when he knew that our mother feared the coming of a Spaniard, and he has made enmity between us and Squire Bozard, our good neighbour who strangely enough does not favour his wooing. It is so, said my father. Thomas, your mother's blood is on your hands. I listened, and could bear this goading injustice no longer. It is false, I said. I say, even to my father, the man had killed my mother before I met him riding back to seek his ship at Yarmouth, and having lost his way, how then is her blood on my hands? As for my wound of late Lily Buzzard, that is my matter, brother, and not yours, though perhaps you wish it was yours and not mine. Why, father, did you not tell me that you feared of this Spaniard? I heard some loose talk, only gave little thought to it, my, my mind being full of other things. And now I will say something. You called down God's curse upon me, father, till such time as I should find this murderer and finish what I had begun. Well, so be it. Let God's curse rest upon me until I do find him. I am young, but I am quick and strong, and so soon as may be I start for Spain to hunt him there, till I shall run him down or know him to be dead. If you will give me money to help me on my quest, so be it. If not, I go without it. I swear before God and my mother's spirit that I will neither rest nor stay, till with the very sword that slew her I have avenged her blood upon her murderer, or know him dead, and if I suffer myself to be led astray from this purpose of this oath by aught that is, then may a worse end than hers overtake me. May my soul be rejected in heaven and my name be shameful for ever upon earth. Thus I swore in my rage and anguish, holding up my hand to heaven that I called upon to witness the oath. My father looked at me keenly. If that is your mind, son Thomas, you shall not lack for money. I would go myself, for blood must be wiped out with blood, but I am too broken in my health. Also I am known in Spain, and the Holy Office would claim me there. Go, and my blessings go with you. It is right that you should go, for it is through your folly that our enemy has escaped us. Yes, it is right that he should go, said Geoffrey. You say that because you wish to get rid of me, Geoffrey. I answered hotly, and you would be rid of me because you desire to take place at the side of a certain maid. Follow your nature, and do as you will, but if you would outwit an absent man, no good shall come of it. The girl is to him who can win her, he said. The girl's heart is already won, Geoffrey. You may buy her from father but you can never win her heart, and without, without a heart she will be but a poor prize. Peace! Now is no time to talk of such love and maids, said my father. And listen, this is the tale of the Spanish murderer and your mother. I have said nothing of it before, but now it must out. Now, when I was a lad, it happened that I also went to Spain, because my father willed it. I went to a monastery at Seville, but I had no liking for monks and their ways, and I broke out from the monastery. For a year or more, 
I made my living as best I might, for I feared to return to England as a runaway. Still, I made a living, and not a bad one. Now in this way and now in that, but though I am ashamed to say it, mostly by gaming at which I had great luck. And in that, one night I met this man, Juan de Garcia, for in his hate he gave you his true name when he would have stabbed you, at play. Even then he had an evil fame, though he was scarcely more than a lad, but he was a handsome in person, set high in birth and of pleasing nature. It chanced that he won of me at the dice, and being in a good humour, he took me to visit at the house of his aunt, his uncle's widow, a lady of Seville. This aunt was one child, a daughter, and that daughter was your mother. Now your mother, Luisa de Garcia, was affianced to her cousin Juan de Garcia, not with her own will indeed, for the contract had been signed when she was only eight years old. Still it was binding, more binding indeed than in this country, being in marriage in all except in fact. But those women who are bound for the most part to bear no wife's love in their heart, and so it was with your mother. Indeed, she both hated and feared her cousin Juan, though I think he loved her more than anything on earth and by one pretext and another she contrived to bring him to the agreement that no marriage should be celebrated till she was twenty years of age. But the colder she was to him, the more was he inflamed with desire to win, and also her possessions, which were not small, for like all Spaniards he was passionate, and like most gamesters and men of li evil life, much in want of money. Now, to be brief, from the ver first moment that your mother and I set eyes on each other, we loved one another, and it was our one desire to meet as often as might be. And in this we had no great difficulty, for her mother was also feared and hated Juan de Garcia, her nephew by marriage, and would have seen her daughter clear of him if possible. The end of it was that I told my love and I, a plot was made between us that we should fly to England. But all this had not escaped the ears of Juan, who had spies in the household, and was jealous and revengeful as only a Spaniard could be. First he tried to be rid of me by challenging me to a duel, but we were parted before we could draw swords. Then he hired bravos to murder me, as I walked the streets at night. But I wore a chain shirt beneath my doublet, and their daggers broke upon it, and in place of being slain I slew one of them. Twice baffled, de Garcia was not defeated. Fight and murder had failed, but another and surer means remained. I know not how, but he had won some clue to the mystery of my life, and of how I had broken out of the monastery. It was left to him, therefore, to denounce me to the holy office as a renegade and an infidel, and this he did one night. It was the night before the day when we should have taken ship. I was sitting with your mother and her mother in the house at Seville, when six cowled men entered and seized me without a word. When I prayed to know their purpose, they gave me no answer other than to hold a crucifix before my eyes. Then I knew why I was taken, and the women ceased clinging to me and fell back sobbing. Secretly, and silently I was hurried away to the dungeons of the Holy Office. But of all that befell me there, I will not stop to tell. But twice I was racked, once I was seared with what hot irons, thrice I was flogged with wire whips, 
and all this while I was fed on food such as we would scarcely give to a dog here in England. At length my offence of having escaped from a monastery and sundry blasphemies, so called, being proved against me, I was condemned to death by fire. Then at last, when after a long year of torment and of horror, I had abandoned hope and resigned myself to die, help came. On the eve of the day upon which I was to be consumed by flame, the chief of my tormentors entered the dungeon where I lay on straw, and embracing me, bade me to be of good cheer, for the church had taken pity on my youth and given me my freedom. At first I laughed wildly, for I thought that this was but another torment. And not till I was freed of my fetters, clothed in decent garments, and set at midnight outside the prison gates, would I believe that so good a thing had befallen me through the hand of God. I stood weak and wondering outside the gates, not knowing where to fly. And as I stood, a woman glided up to me, wrapped in a black cloak, who whispered, Come! That woman was your mother. She had learned my fate from the boasting of de Garcia, and set herself to save me. Thrice her plans failed, but at length, through the help of some cunning agent, gold won what was denied to justice and to mercy, and my life and liberty were brought with a very great sum. That same night we were married and fled for Cadiz, your mother and I, but not her mother, who was bedridden with sickness. For my sake your beloved mother abandoned her people. What remained to her of her fortune after paying the price of my life and her country, so strong is the love of woman? All had been made ready, for at Cadiz lay an English ship, the Mary of Bristol, in which passage was taken for us. But the Mary was delayed in port by a contrary wind, which blew so strongly that notwithstanding his desire to save us, her master dared not take to the sea. Two days and a night we lay in the harbour, fearing all sorts, not without cause, and yet most happy in each other's love. Now those who had charge of me in the dungeon had given out that I had escaped by the help of the master of the devil, and I was searched for throughout the countryside. De Garcia also, finding that his cousin and affianced wife was missing, guessed that we two were not far apart. It was his cunning, sharpened by jealousy and hate, that dogged us down step by step till at length he found us. On the morning of the third day, the gale having abated, the anchor of the Mary was got home, and she swung out into the tideway. As she came round, and while the seamen were making ready to hoist the sails, a boat carrying some twenty soldiers, and followed by two others, shot alongside and summoned the captain to heave too that his ship might be boarded, and searched under warrant from the Holy Office. It chanced that I was on deck at the time, and suddenly, as I prepared to hide myself below, a man, in whom I knew de Garcia himself, stood up and called out that I was the escaped heretic whom they sought. Fearing lest their ship should be boarded, and he himself thrown into prison with the rest of the crew, the captain would then have surrendered me. But I, desperate with fear, tore my clothes from my body and showed the cruel scars that marked it. You are Englishmen, I cried to the sailors, and will you deliver me to these foreign devils who am of your blood? Look, look at their handiwork. And I pointed to the half-healed scars left by the red-hot pincers. If you give me up, you send me back for more of this torment, and to death by burning. P 
pity my wife if you will not pity me, or if you will pity neither, then lend me a sword that by death I may save myself from torture. Then one of the seamen, a southward man, who had been known my father, called out, By God, I will once stand by you, Thomas Wingfield. If they want you and your sweet lady, they must kill me first. And seizing a bow from the back, he drew it out of the case and strung it, and setting an arrow on the string, he pointed at the Spaniards in the boat. Then the others broke into shouts of, If you want any man far among us, come abroad and take him, you torturing devils, and the like. Seeing where the hearts of the crew lay, the captain found courage in his turn. He made no answer to the Spaniards, but bade half the men hoist the sails with all speed, and the rest make ready to keep off soldiers, should they seek to board us. By now the other two boats had come up and fastened on to us with their hooks. One man climbed into the chains, and thence onto the deck, and I knew him for the priest of the holy office, one of those who had stood by while I was tormented. Then I grew mad at the thought of all that I had suffered, while that devil watched, bidding them lay on for the love of God. Snatching the bow from the hand of the Southwell seaman, I drew the arrow to his head and loosed it. It did not miss its mark, for like you, Thomas, I was skilled with the bow, and he dived back into the sea with an English yard shaft in his heart. After that they tried to board us no more, though they shot at us with arrows, wounding one man. The captain called us to lay down our bows and take up cover behind the bulwarks, but for by now the sails began to draw. Then de Garcia stood up in the boat and cursed me and my wife. "'I will find you yet,' he screamed, with many Spanish oaths and foul words. If I must wait for twenty years, I will be avenged upon you and all you love. Be assured of this, Louisa de Garcia. Hide where you will. I will find you, and when we meet, you shall come with me for so long as I will keep you, or that you will be the hour of your death. Then we sailed away for England, and the boats fell astern. My sons, this is the story of my youth, and how I came to wed your mother, whom I have buried to-day. Juan de Garcia has kept his words. Yet it seems strange, said my brother, that after all these years he should have murdered her thus, whom you say he loved. Surely even the evilest of men had shrunk away from such a deed. There is little that is strange about it answered my father. How can we know what words were spoken before they was he stabbed her? Doubtless he told her some of them when he cried to Thomas that now they would see what truth there was in prophecies. What did de Garcia swear years since? That she should come with him, or he would kill her. Your mother was still beautiful, Geoffrey and he may have given her choice between flight and death. Seek to know no more, son. And suddenly my father hid his face in his hands and broke into sobs that were dreadful. Would that you had told us this tale before, father, I said, so soon as I could speak, then there would have lived a devil the less in the world today, and I should have been spared a long journey. Oh, little did I know how long that journey would be. End of chapter 5 Recording by Patrick 79「Chapter 6 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter six. Goodbye, sweetheart. 
within twelve days of the burial of my mother and the telling of the story of his marriage to her by my father i was ready to start upon my search as it chanced a vessel was about to sail from yarmouth to cadiz she was named the adventurous of one hundred tons burden and carried wool and other goods outwards proposing to return with a cargo of wine and yew staves for bows in this vessel my father bought me a passage moreover he gave me fifty pounds in gold which was as much as i would risk upon my person and obtained letters from yarmouth firm of merchants to their agents in cadiz in which they were advised to advance me such sums as i might need up to a total of one hundred and fifty english pounds and further to assist me in any way that was possible now the ship adventurous was to sail on the third day of june already it was the first of that month and that evening i must ride to yarmouth whither my baggage had gone already except one my farewells were made and yet that was the one i most wished to make since that day when we had sworn our troth i had gained no sight of lily except once at my mother's burial and then we had not spoken now it seemed that i must go without any parting word for a father had sent me notice that if i came near the hall his serving-man had orders to thrust me from the door and this was a shame that i could not risk yet it was hard that i must go upon so long a journey whence it well might chance i should not return and bid her no good-bye well in my grief and perplexity i spoke to my father telling him how matters stood and asking him his help i go hence i said to avenge our common loss and if need to give my life for the honour of our name aid me then in this little thing my neighbour bozard means his daughter for your brother geoffrey and not for you thomas he answered and a man may do what he wills with his own still i will help you if i can at least he cannot drive me from his door bid them bring horses and we will ride to the hall within the half of an hour we were there and my father asked for speech with his master the serving man looked at me askance remembering his orders still he ushered us into the justice room where the squire sat drinking ale good morrow to you neighbour said the squire you are welcome here but you bring the one with you who is not welcome though he be your son i bring him for the last time friend bozard listen to his request then grant it or refuse it as you will but if you refuse it it will not bind us closer the lad rides to-night to take his ship for spain to seek that man who murdered his mother he goes of his own free will because after the doing of the deed it was he who unwittingly suffered the murderer to escape and it is well that he should go he is a young hound to run such a quarry to earth and in a strange country said the squire still i like his spirit and wish him well what would he of me leave to bid farewell to your daughter i know that his suit does not please you and cannot wander at it and for my own part i think it too early for him to set his fancy in a way at marriage but if he would see the maid it can do no harm for such harm as there is has been done already now i wait for your answer squire bozard thought a while then said the lad is a brave lad though he shall be no son of law of mine he is going far and mayhap will return no more and i do not wish that he should think unkindly of me when i am dead go without thomas wingfield 
and stand under yonder, yonder beech. Lily shall join you there, and you may speak with her, for half of an hour, and no more. See to it that you keep within sight of the window. Nay, no thanks. Go, before I change my mind. So I went and waited under the beech and a beating heart, and presently Lily glided up to me, a more welcome sight to my eyes than the angel out of heaven. And, indeed, I doubt if an angel could have been more fair than she, or more good and gentle. "'Oh, Thomas,' she whispered, when I had greeted her, "'is this true that you sail over sea to seek the Spaniard?' I sail to seek the Spaniard, and to find him, and to kill him when he is found. It was to come to you, Lily, that I let him go. Now I must let you go to come to him. Nay, oh, do not weep. I have sworn to do it, and were I to break my oath, I should be dishonoured. And because of this oath of yours, I must be widowed, Thomas before I am your wife. You go, and I shall never see you more. Who can say, my sweet? My father went overseas and came back safe, having passed through many perils. Yes, and he came back, and not alone. You are young, Thomas, and in far countries there are ladies great and fair, and how shall I hold my own in your heart against them? I being so far away. I swear to you, Lily, nay, Thomas, swear no oaths, lest you should add to your sins by breaking them. Yet, love, forget me not. Who shall forget you never? Perhaps, oh, it wrings my heart to say it, this is our last meeting on the earth. If so, then we must hope to meet in heaven at least be sure of this while i live i will be true to you and father or no father i will die before i break my troth i am young to speak so largely but it shall be as i say oh this parting is more cruel than death would that we were asleep and forgotten among men yet it is best that you should go for if you stayed, what could we be to each other while my father lives? And may he live long. Sleep and forgetfulness will come soon enough, Lily. None must wait them for love very long. Meanwhile, we have our lives to live. Let us pray that we may live them to each other. I go to seek fortune as well as foes, and I will win it for your sake, that we may marry. She shook her head sadly. It were too much happiness, Thomas. Men and women may seldom wed their true loves, or if they do, it is but to lose them. At the least we love, and let us be thankful that we have learned what love can be, for none having loved here, Perchance, at the worst, we may love otherwhere, when there are none to say us nay. Then we talked on a while, babbling broken words of love and hope and sorrow, as young folks so placed are wont to do, till at length Lily looked up with a sad sweet smile and said, It is time to go, sweetheart. My father beckons me from the lattice. All is finished. Let us go, then, I answered huskily, and drew her behind the trunk of the old beech, and there I caught her in my arms and kissed her again and yet again, nor was she ashamed to kiss me back. After this I remember a little of what happened, except that as we rode away I saw her beloved face wan and wistful, watching me departing out of her life. For twenty years that sad and beautiful face haunted me, and it haunts me yet athwart life and death. 
other women have loved me and i have known other partings some of them more terrible but the memory of this woman as she was then and of her farewell look overruns them all whenever i gave down the past i see this picture framed in it and i know that it is one which cannot fade are there any sorrows like these sorrows of our youth can any bitterness equal the bitterness of such good-byes i know but one of which i was fated to taste in after years and that shall be told of in its place it is a common jest to mock at early love but if it be real if it be something more than the mere arisings of passion early love is late love also it is love for ever the best and the worst event that can befall a man or a woman i say it who am old and who have done with everything and it is true one thing i have forgotten as we kissed and clung under despair behind the bowl of the great beech lily drew a ring from her finger and pressed it into my hand saying look on this each morning when you wake and think of me it had been her mother's and to-day it is still set upon my withered hand gleaming in the winter sunlight as i trace these words through the long years of wild adventure through all the time of after peace in love and war in the shine of the campfire in the glare of the sacrificial flame in the light of lonely stars illuminating the lonely wilderness that ring has shone upon my hand reminding me always of her who gave it and on this hand it shall go down into the grave it is a plain circlet of thick gold somewhat worn now a posy ring and on its inner surface is cut this quaint couplet heart to heart though far apart a fitting motto for us indeed and one that has its meaning to this hour that same day of our farewell i rode with my father to yarmouth my brother geoffrey did not come with us but we parted with kindly words and of this i am glad for we never saw each other again no more was said between us as to lily bozard and our wooing of her though i knew well enough that so soon as my back was turned he would try to take my place at her side as it indeed happened i forgive him to it in truth i cannot blame him much for what man is there that would not have desired to wed lily who knew her once we were dear friends geoffrey and i but when we ripened towards manhood our love of lily came between us and we grew more and more apart it is a common case enough well as it chanced he failed so why should i think unkindly of him let me rather remember the affection of our childhood and forget the rest god rest his soul mary my sister who after lily bozard was now the fairest maiden in the countryside wept much at my going there was but a year between us and we loved each other dearly for no such shadow of jealousy had fallen on our affection i comforted her as well as i was able and telling her all that had passed between me and lily i prayed her to stand my friend and lily's should it ever be in her power to do so this lily promised to do readily enough and though she did not give the reason i could see that she thought it was possible that she might be able to help us as i have said lily had a brother a young man of some promise who at this time was away at college and he and my sister mary had a strong fancy for each other that might or might not ripen into something closer so we kissed and bade farewell with tears and after that my father and i rode away 
but when we had passed down Pernhouse Street and mounted the little hill beyond Wangford Mills to the left of Bungay Town, I halted my horse and looked back upon the pleasant valley of the Waveney where I was born, and my heart grew full to bursting. Had I known all that must befall me before my eyes beheld that scene again, I think indeed that it would have burst. But God, who in his wisdom has laid many a burden upon the backs of men, has saved them from this. For we had foreknowledge of the future. I think that of our own will, but few of us would live to see it. So I cast one long last look towards the distant mass of oaks that marked the spot where Lily lived and rode on. On the following day I embarked on board the adventurous, and we sailed. Before I left my father's heart softened much towards me, for he remembered that I was my mother's best beloved, and feared also lest we should not meet again. So much did it soften indeed that at the last hour he changed his mind and wished to hold me back from going. But having put my hand to the plough and suffered all the bitterness of farewell, I would not return to be mocked by my brother and my neighbours. "'You speak too late, father,' I said. "'You desired me to go to work his vengeance, and stirred me to it with many bitter words. And now I would go if I knew that I must die within a week, for such oaths cannot be lightly broken.' Until mine is fulfilled, the curse rests on me. Oh, so be it, son, he answered with a sigh. Your mother's cruel death maddened me, and I said I may live to be sorry for it, though at the best I shall not live long, for my heart is broken. Perhaps I should have remembered that vengeance is in the hand of the Lord, who wreaks it at his own time and without our help. Oh, do not think unkindly of me, my boy, if we should chance to meet no more, for I do love you, and it was but the deeper love that I bore to your mother which made me deal harshly with you. Oh, I know it, father, and I bear no grudge. But if you think that you owe me anything— Pay it by holding my brother from working wrong to me and Lily Bozard while I am absent. I will do my best, son, though were it not that you and she may have grown so dear to each other, the match would have pleased me well. But, as I have said, I shall not be long here to watch your welfare in this or any other matter, and when I am gone things must follow their own fate. Do not forget your God or your home wherever you chance to wander, Thomas. Keep yourself from brawling, beware of women that are a snare of youth, and set a watch upon your tongue and your temper, which is not of the best. Moreover, wherever you may be, do not speak ill of the religion of the land, or make a mock of it by your way of, our, of life lest you should learn how cruel men can be when they think that it is pleasing to their gods, as I have learnt already. I said that I would bear his counsel in mind, and indeed he saved me from many a sorrow. Then he embraced me, and called on the Almighty to take me in his care, and we parted. I never saw him more, for though he was but middle-aged, Within a year of my going, my father died suddenly of a distemper of the heart in the nave of Dick Chingham Church, as he stood there near the rude screen, musing by my mother's grave one Sunday after Mass, and my brother took his lands and place. God rest him also. He was a true-hearted man, but more wrapped up in the love for my mother than it was well for any man to be who would look at life largely and do right by all. For such love, though natural to women, is apt to turn to something that partakes of selfishness, and to cause him to bear it 
to think all else of small account. His children were nothing to my father when compared to my mother, and he would have been content to lose every one of them, if thereby he might have purchased back her life. But after all, it was a noble infirmity, for he thought little of himself and had gone through much to win her. Of my voyage to Cadiz, to which port I had learned that de Garcia's ship was bound, there is little to be told. We met with contrary winds in the Bay of Biscay, and were driven into the harbour of Lisbon, where we were refitted. But at last we came safely to Cadiz, having been forty days at sea. End of chapter 6 Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter seven Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter seven Andre de Fonseca. Now I shall dwell but briefly on all the adventures which befell me during this year or so that I remained in Spain, for were I to set out everything at length, this history would have no end, or at least mine would find me before I came to it. Many travellers have told of the glories of Seville, to which ancient Moorish city I journeyed with all speed, sailing there up the Guadalquivir and I have to tell of lands from which no other wanderer has returned to England, and must press on to them. To be short, then, foreseeing that it might be necessary for me to stop some time in Seville, and being desirous to escape notice and to be at the smallest expense possible, I bethought me that it would be well if I could find means of continuing my studies of medicine and to this end I obtained certain introductions from the firm of merchants to whose care I had been recommended, addressed to doctors of medicine in Seville. These letters, at my request, were made out not in my own name but that in Diego Delia, for I did not wish to be known that I was an Englishman, nor, indeed, was this likely except my speech should betray me, for, as I have said, in appearance I was very Spanish, and the hindrance of the language was one that lessened every day, since having already learned it from my mother, and taking every opportunity to speak and read it, and within six months I could talk Castilian except for some slight accent, like a native of the land. Also, I have a gift for acquiring languages. When I was come to Seville, and had placed my baggage in an inn, not one of the most frequented, I set out to deliver a letter of recommendation to a famous physician in the town, whose name I have long forgotten. This physician had a fine house in the street of Las Palmas, a great avenue planted with, with graceful trees that has other little streets running into it. Down one of these I came from my inn, a quiet, narrow place having houses with patios and courtyards on either side of it. As I walked down the street I noticed a man sitting in the shade on a stool in the doorway of his patio. He was small and withered, with keen black eyes and a wonderful air of wisdom, and he watched me as I went by. Now the house of the famous physician whom I sought was so placed that the man sitting at this doorway could command it with his eyes, and take note of all who went in and came out. When I found the house, I returned again into the quiet street, and walked to and fro for a while, thinking of what tale I should tell to the physician. And all the time the little man watched me with his keen eyes. At last I had made up my story and went to the house, only to find that the physician was away from home. 
having inquired when i might find him i left and once more took to the narrow street walking slowly till i came to where the little man sat as i passed him his broad hat with which he was fanning himself slipped to the ground before my feet i stooped down lifted it up from the pavement and restored it to him a thousand thanks young sir he said in a full and gentle voice you are courteous for a foreigner how do you know me to be a foreigner signor i asked surprised out of my caution if i had not guessed it before i should know it now he answered smiling gravely your castilian tells its own tale i bowed and was about to pass on when he addressed me again what is your hurry young sir step in and take a cup of wine with me it is good i was about to say nay when it came into my mind that i had nothing to do and that perhaps i might learn something from this gossip the day is hot signor and i accept he spoke no more but rising led me into a courtyard paved with marble in the centre of which was a basin of water having vines trined around it here were chairs on a little table placed in the shade of the vines when he had closed the door of the patio and we were seated he rang a silver bell that stood upon the table and a girl young and fair appeared from the house dressed in a quaint spanish dress bring wine said my host the wine was brought white wine of a porto such as I, I had never tasted before your health signor and my host stopped his glass in his hand and looked at me inquiringly diego delia he answered hmm. he said a spanish name or perhaps an imitation spanish name for i do not know it and i have a good head for names that is my name take it or leave it signor and i looked at him in turn andre don fonseca he replied bowing a physician of this city well known enough especially among the fair well signor diego i take my name for names are nothing and at times it is convenient to change them which is nobody's business except their owners i see you are a stranger in the city no need to look surprised signor the one who is familiar with the town does not gaze and stare and ask the path of passers-by's nor does a native of seville walk in the sunny side of the street in summer and now if you will not think me impertinent i will ask you what can be the business of so healthy a young man with my rival yonder and he nodded towards the house of the famous physician a man's business like his name is his own affair signor i answered setting my host down in my mind as one of those who disgrace our art by plying openly for patients that they may capture their fees still i will tell you i am also a physician though not yet fully qualified and i seek a place where i might help some doctor of repute in his daily practice and thus gain experience and my living with it ah it is so well signor then you will look in vain yonder and again he nodded towards the physician's house such as he will take no apprentice without the fee being large indeed it is not the custom of this city oh then i must seek a livelihood elsewhere or otherwise i did not say so now signor let us see what you know of medicine and what is more important of human nature for of the first 
none of us can ever know much, but he who knows the latter will be a leader of men, or of women, who lead the men. And without much more ado, he put me many questions, each of them so shrewd and going so directly to the heart of the matter in hand, that I marvelled at his sagacity. Some of these questions were medical, dealing chiefly with the ailments of women, others were general, and dealt more with their characters. At length he finished. Ah, you will do, signor, he said. You are a young man of parts and promise, though, as was to be expected from one of your years, you do lack experience. There is stuff in you, signor, and you have a heart, which is a good thing, for the blunders of a man with a heart often carry him further than the cunning of the cynic. Also you have a will, and know how to direct it. I bowed, and did my best to hold back my satisfaction at his words from showing in my face. Still, he went on, all this would not cause me to submit to you the offer that I am about to make, for many a prettier fellow than yourself is, after all, unlucky, or a fool at the bottom, or bad-tempered and destined to the dogs. As for aught I know, you may be also but I take my chance of that, because you suit me in another way. Perhaps you may scarcely know it yourself, but you have beauty, signor, beauty of a very rare and singular type, which half the ladies of Seville will praise when they come to know you. <laughs> I am much flattered, I said. But might I ask what all these compliments may mean? To be brief, what is your offer? Oh, to be brief, then, it is this. I am in need of an assistant who must possess all the qualities I see in you, but most of all one which I can only guess you to possess. Discretion. That assistant would not be ill-paid, this house would be at his disposal, and he would have the opportunity of learning the world, such as are given to few. Now, what say you? Oh, I say this, signor, that I should wish to know more of the business in which I am expected to assist. Your offers sound too liberal and I fear that I must earn your bounty by the doing of work that honest men might shrink from. Oh, a fair argument, but as it happens, not quite a correct one. Listen, you have been told that yonder physician to whose house you went but now, and these, he repeated four or five names, are the greatest of their tribe in Seville. It is not so. I am the greatest and the richest, and I do more business than any two of them. Do you know what my earnings have been this day alone? I will tell you. Just over twenty-five gold pesos, more than all the rest of the profession have taken together, I will wager. You want to know how I earn so much. You want to know also why, if I have earned so much, I am not content to rest from my labours. Good, I will tell you. I earn it by ministering to the vanities of women, and sheltering them from the results of their own folly. As a lady a sore heart, she comes to me for comfort and advice. As she pimples on her face, she flies to me to cure them. Has she a secret love affair? It is I who hide her indiscretion. I consult the future for her. I help her to her to atone the past. I doctor her for imaginary ailments, and often enough I cure her of real ones. Half the secrets of Seville are in my hands. 
did I choose to speak I could set a score of noble houses to broil and bloodshed, but I do not speak. I am paid to keep silent, and when I am not paid, still I keep silent for my credit's sake. Hundreds of women think me their saviour. I know them for my dupes. But mark you, I do not push this game too far. A love filter of coloured water, I may give it a price, but not a poisoned rose. These they must seek elsewhere. For the rest, in my way, I am honest. I take the world as it comes. That is all. And as women will be fools, I profit by their folly and I have grown rich upon it. Yes, I have grown rich, and yet I cannot stop. I love money, that is power, but more than all I love the way of life. Talk of romances and adventure! What romance or adventure is half so wonderful as those that come daily to my notice? And I play a part in every one of them, and none the less a leading part, because I do not shout and strut upon the boards. If all this is so, why do you seek the help of an unknown lad, a stranger of whom you know nothing? I asked bluntly. Oh, truly, you lack experience, the old man answered with a laugh. Do you then suppose that I should choose one who was not a stranger? One who might have ties within the city, which I was unacquainted? And as for knowing nothing of you, young man, do you think that I have followed this strange trade of mine for forty years without learning to judge at sight? Perhaps I know you better than you know yourself. By the way, the fact that you are deeply enamoured of that maid whom you have left in England is a recommendation to me, for whatever follies you may commit, you will scarcely embarrass me and yourself by suffering affections to be seriously entangled. Ha-ha! <laughs> I have astonished you. How, how do you know? I began, then ceased. How do I know? Why, easily enough. Those boots you wear were made in England. I have seen many such when I travelled there. Your accent also, though faint, is English. And twice you have spoken English words when your Castilian failed you. Then, for the maid, is not that a betrothal ring upon your hand? And when I spoke to you of the ladies of this country, my talk did not interest you over much as at your age it had done were your heart whole surely also the lady is fair and tall ah i thought so i have noticed that men and women love their opposite in colour no invariable rule indeed but good for a guess you are very clever, signor. No, not clever, but trained, as you will be when you have been a year in my hands, though perchance you do not intend to stop so long in Seville. Perhaps you came here with an object, and wish to pass the time profitably till it is fulfilled. A good guess again, I think. Well, so be it. I will risk that. Object and attainment are often far apart. Do you take my offer? I incline to do so. Then you will take it. Now, I have something more to say before we come to terms. I do not want you to play the part of an apothecary's drudge. 
you will figure before the world as my nephew, come from abroad to learn my trade. You will help me in it, indeed, but that is not all your duty. Your part will be to mix in the life of Seville, and to watch those whom I bid you watch, to drop a word here and a hint there, and in a hundred ways that I shall show you to draw grist to my mill, and to your own. You must be brilliant and witty, or sad and learned, as I wish. You must make the most of your person and your talents, for these will go far with my customers. To the Hidalgo you must talk of arms, to the Lady of Love but you must never commit yourself beyond redemption. And above all, young man, and here his manner changed, and his face grew stern and almost fierce, you must never violate my confidence, or the confidence of my clients. On this point I will be quite open with you, and I pray you, for your own sake, to believe what I say however much you may mistrust the rest. If you break faith with me, you die. You die. Not by my hand, but you die. That is my price. Take it or leave it. Should you leave it, and go hence to tell what you have heard this day. Even then misfortune may overtake you suddenly. Do you understand? I understand. For my own sake I will respect your confidence. Young sir, I like you better than ever. Had you said that you would respect it because it was a confidence, I should have mistrusted you, for doubtless you feel that secrets communicated so readily have no claim to be held sacred. Nor have they, but when their violation involves the sad and accidental end of the violator, it is another matter. Well now, do you accept? I accept. Good. Your baggage, I suppose, is at the inn. I will send porters to discharge your score, and bring it here. No need for you to go, nephew. Let us stop and drink another glass of wine. The sooner we grow intimate, the better. Nephew. It was thus that first that I became acquainted with Signor André de Fonseca, my benefactor, the strangest man who I have ever known. Doubtless any person reading this history would think that I, the narrator, was sowing a plentiful crop of troubles for myself in having to deal with him, setting him down as a rogue of the deepest, such as sometimes for their own wicked purposes decoy young men to crime and ruin. But it was not so, and this is the strangest part of the story. All that André de Fonseca told me was true, to the very letter. He was a gentleman of great talent who had been rendered a little mad by misfortunes in his early life. As a physician, I have never met his master, if indeed he has one in these times, and as a man versed in the world, and more especially in the world of women, I have known none to compare with him. He had travelled far and seen much, and he forgot nothing. In part he was a quack, but his quackery always had a meaning in it. He fleeced the foolish, indeed and even juggled with astronomy making money out of their superstition, but on the other hand he did many a kind act without any reward. 
he would make a rich lady pay ten gold pesos for the dyeing of her hair but often he would nurse some poor girl through the trouble her troubles and ask no charge yes and find her honest employment after it he who knew all the secrets of seville never made money out of them by threat of exposure as he said because it would not pay to do so but really because though he affected to be a selfish knave at bottom his heart was honest for my own part i found life with him both easy and happy so far as mine could be quite happy soon i learned my role and played it well it was given out that i was his nephew of the rich old physician fonseca whom he was training to take his place and this together with my own appearance and manners ensured me a welcome in the best houses of seville here i took that share of our business which my master could not take for now he never mixed among the fashion of the city money i was supplied with in abundance so that i could ruffle it with the best but soon it became known that i looked to business as well as to pleasure often and often during a gay ball or carnival a lady would glide up to me and ask beneath her breath if don andre fonseca would consent to see her privately on a matter of some importance and i would fix an hour there and then had it not been for me such patience would have been lost to us since for the most part their timidity had kept them away in the same fashion when the festival was ended and i prepared to wend homewards now and again a gallant would slip his arm in mine and ask my master's help in some affair of love or honour or even of the purse then i would lead him straight to the old moorish house where don andres sat writing in his velvet robe like some spider in his web for most of his business was done at night and straight away the matter would be attended to to my master's profit and satisfaction of all by degrees it became known that though i was young yet i had discretion and that nothing which went in at my ears came out at my lips that i neither brawled nor drank nor gambled to any length and that though i was friendly with many fair ladies there were none who were entitled to know my secrets also it became known that i had some skill in the art of healing and it was said among the ladies of seville that there lived no man in that city so deft at clearing the skin of blemishes or changing the colour of the hair as old fonseca's nephew and as any one may know this reputation alone was worth a fortune thus it came about that i was more and more consulted on my own account in short things went well with us in the first six months of my service i added by one-third to the receipts of my master's practice large as they had been before besides lightening his labours not a little it was a strange life and of the things that i saw and learned could they be written i might make a tale indeed but they have no part in this history for it was as though the smiles and silence with which men and women hide their thoughts were done away with and their hearts spoke to us of the accents of truth now some fair young maid or wife would come to us with confessions of wickedness that would be thought impossible did not her story prove itself the secret murder perchance of a spouse or a lover or a rival now some aged dame would win a husband in his teens now some wealthy low-born man or woman who desired to buy an alliance with one lacking money but of noble blood such i did not care to help indeed but to the love-sick or the love-deluded i listened with a ready ear 
for I had a fellow feeling with them. Indeed, so deep and earnest was my sympathy that more than once I found the unhappy fair ready to transfer their infections to my unworthy self, and in fact once things came about so that, had I willed it, I could have married one of the loveliest and wealthiest noble ladies of Seville. But I would have none of it. Who thought of my English lily by day and by night? End of chapter 7 Recording by Patrick 79 Chapter Eight of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Eight, The Second Meeting. It may be thought that while I was employed thus, I had forgotten the object of my coming to Spain, namely to avenge my mother's murder on the person of Juan de Garcia. But this was not so. So soon as I was settled in the house of André de Fonseca, I set myself to make inquiries as to de Garcia's whereabouts, with all possible diligence, but without result. Indeed, when I came to consider the matter coolly, it seemed that I had but a slender chance of finding him in this city. He had, indeed, given it out in Yarmouth that he was bound for Seville, but no ship bearing the same name as his had put in at Cadiz, or sailed up the Guadalquivir. Nor was it likely, having committed murder in England, that he would speak the truth of his destination. Still, I searched on. The house where my mother and grandmother had lived was burned down, and as their mode of life had been retired after more than twenty years of change, few even remembered their existence. Indeed, I only discovered one, an old woman who I found living in extreme poverty, and who once had been my grandmother's servant and knew my mother well although she was not in the house at the time of her flight to England. From this woman I gathered some information, though needless to say I did not tell her that I was the grandson of the old mistress. It seemed that after my mother fled to England with my father, de Garcia persecuted my grandmother and his aunt with lawsuits, and by any other means, till at last she was reduced to beggary, in which condition the villain left her to die. So poor was she indeed that she was buried in a public grave. After that the old woman, my informant, said she had heard that de Garcia had committed some crime and had been forced to flee the country. What the crime was she could not remember, but it happened about fifteen years ago. All this I learned when I had been about three months in Seville, though it was of interest it did not advance me in my search. Some four or five nights afterwards, as I entered my employer's house, I met a young woman coming out of the doorway of the patio. She was thickly veiled, and my notice was drawn to her by her tall and beautiful figure, and because she was weeping so violently that her body shook with sobs. I was already well accustomed to such sights, for many of those who sought my master's counsel had good cause to weep, and I passed her without remark. But when I was come into the room where he received his patients, I mentioned that I had met such a person, and asked if it was any one he knew. Ah, ha, ha, nephew, said Van Secker, who always called me thus by now, and indeed began to treat me with as much affection as though if I really were of his blood. 
a sad case. But you do not know her, and she is no paying patient. A poor girl of noble birth who had entered religion and taken her vows. When a gallant appears, meets her secretly in the convent garden, promises to marry her if she will fly with him. Indeed, does go through some mummery of marriage with her, so she says, and the rest of it. Now he has deserted her, and she is in trouble. And what is more, should the priest catch her, likely to learn what it feels like to die by inches in a convent wall. She came to me for counsel, and bought some silver ornaments as the fee. Here they are. You took them? Oh, yes, I took them. I always take a fee, but I gave her back their weight in gold. What is more, I told her where she might hide from the priest till the hunt is done with. What I did not tell her is that her lover is the greatest villain who ever trod the streets of Seville. What was the good? She will see little more of him. Shh! Here comes the Duchess, an astrological case. Where are the horoscope and the wand? Yes, oh, and the crystal ball. There, shade the lamps, give me the book, and vanish. I obeyed, and presently met the great lady, a stout woman, attended by a duenna, gliding fearfully through the darkened archways to learn the answers of the stars, and pay many good pesos for it, and the sight of her made me laugh so much that I forgot quickly about the other lady and her woes. And now I must tell how I met my cousin and my enemy, de Garcia, for the second time. Two days after my meeting with the veiled lady, it chanced that I was wandering towards midnight through a lonely part of the old city, little frequented by passers-by. It was scarcely safe to be thus alone in such a place and hour but the business with which I had been charged by my master was one that must be carried out unattended. Also, I had no enemies whom I knew of, and was armed with the very sword that I had taken from de Garcia in the lane at Ditchingham, the sword that had slain my mother, and which I bore in the hope that it might serve to adventure. In the use of this weapon, I had grown expert enough by now, for every morning I took lessons in the art of fence. My business being done, I was walking slowly homeward, and as I went I fell to thinking of the strangeness of my present life, and of how far it differed from my boyhood in the valley of the Waveney, and of many other things. And then I thought of Lily, and wondered how her days had passed and if my brother Geoffrey persecuted her to marry him, and whether or no she would resist his importunities and her father's. And so, as I walked musing, I came to a water-gate that opened on the Guadalquivir, and, leaning upon the coping of a low wall, I rested there idly to consider the beauty of the night. In truth, it was a lovely night, for across all these years I remember it. Let those who have seen it say if they know any prospect more beautiful than the sight of the August moon shining on the broad waters of the Guadalquivir and the clustering habitations of the ancient city. Now, as I leaned upon the wall and looked, I saw a man pass up the steps beside me and go into the shadow of the street. I took no note of him till presently I heard a murmur of distant voices, and turning my head I discovered that the man was in conversation with a woman who he had met at the head of the path that ran down to the water-gate. 
doubtless it was lovers meeting and since such sights of are of interest to all and more especially to the young i watched the pair soon i learned that there was little of tenderness in this tryst at least on the part of the gallant who drew continually backwards towards me as though he would seek the boat by which doubtless he had come and i marvelled at this for the moonlight shone upon the woman's face and even at that distance i could see that it was very fair the man's face i could not see however since his back was towards me for the most part moreover he wore a large sombrero that shaded it now they came nearer to me the man always drawing backwards and the woman always following till at length they were within earshot the woman was pleading to the man surely you will not desert me she said after marrying me and all that you have sworn you will not have the heart to desert me I abandoned everything for you. I am in great danger. I— And here her voice fell so that I could not catch her words. Then he spoke. Fairest, now as always I adore you, but we must part for a while. You owe me much, Isabella. I have rescued you from the grave. I have taught you what it is to live and love doubtless with your advantages and charms your great charms you will profit by the lesson money i cannot give you for i have none to spare but i have endowed you with experience that is more valuable by far this is our farewell for a little while and i am broken-hearted yet neither fairer skies shine other eyes and i and again he spoke so low that i could not catch his words as he talked on all my body began to tremble the scene was moving indeed but it was not that which stirred me so deeply it was the man's voice and bearing that reminded me no it, it could not it could not scarcely be oh you will not be so cruel said the lady to leave me your wife thus alone in such sore trouble and danger take me with you juan i beseech you and she caught him by the arm and clung to him he shook her from him somewhat roughly and as he did so his wide hat fell to the ground so that the moonlight shone upon his face and by heaven it was he juan de garcia and no other i could not be mistaken there was a deeply carved cruel face the high forehead with a scar on it and the thin sneering mouth the peaked beard and the curling hair chance had given him into my hands and i would kill him or he should kill me i took three paces and stood before him drawing my swords as i came what my love have you a bully at hand he said snapping back astonished your business signor are you here to champion beauty in distress i am here juan de garcia to avenge a murdered woman do you remember a certain river bank away in england where you chanced to meet a lady you had known and to leave her dead or if you had forgotten perhaps at least you will remember this which I carry that it may kill you. And I flashed the sword that had been his before his eyes. Mother of God, it is the English boy who— And he stopped. It is Thomas Wingfield who beat and bound you, and who now proposes to finish what he began yonder as he has sworn. Draw, O Juan de Garcia, I will stab you where you stand. De Garcia heard his speech that to-day seems to me to smack of the theatre though it was spoken in grimmest earnest and his face grew like the face of a trapped wolf 
yet i saw that he had no mind to fight not because of cowardice for to do him just that he was no coward but because of superstition he feared to fight me since as i learned afterwards he believed that he would meet his end at my hand and it was for this reason chiefly that he strove to kill me when we first met the duello has its law senor he said courteously it is not usual to fight thus unseconded and in the presence of a woman if you believe that you have any grievance against me though i know not of what you rave or the name by which you you call me i will meet you where and when you will and all the while he looked over his shoulder seeking some way to escape you will meet me now i answered draw or i strike then he drew and we fell to it desperately enough till the sparks flew indeed the rattle of the steel upon steel rang down the quiet street at first he had somewhat the better of me for my hate made me wild in my play but soon i settled to the work and grew cooler i meant to kill him more i knew that i should kill him if none came between us he was still a better swordsman than i who till i fought with him in the lane at ditchingham had never even seen one of these spanish rapiers but i had the youth and the right on my side as also i had an eye like a hawk's and a wrist of steel slowly i pressed him back and ever my play grew closer and better as his became wilder now i had touched him twice once in the face and i held him with his back against the wall of the way that led down to the water-gate and it had come to this that he scarcely strove to thrust at me at all but stood on his defence waiting till i should tire then when victory was in my hand disaster overtook me for the woman who had been watching bewildered saw that her faithless lover was in danger of death and straightway seized me from behind at the same time sending up shriek after shriek for help i shook her from me quickly enough but not before de garcia seeing his vantage had dealt me a, a coward's thrust that took me in the right shoulder and half crippled me so that in turn i must stand on my defence if i would keep my life in me meanwhile the shrieks had been heard and of a sudden the watch came running round the corner whistling for help de garcia saw them and disengaging suddenly turned and ran for the water's edge the lady also vanishing whither i do not know now the watch was on me and their leader came at me to seize me holding a lantern in his hand i struck it with the handle of the sword so that it fell upon the roadway where it blazed up like a bonfire then i turned and also fled for i did not wish to be dragged before the magistrate of the city as a brawler and in my desire to escape i forgot that de garcia was escaping also away i went and three of the watch after me but they were stout and scant of breath and by the time that i had run three furlongs i distanced them i halted to get my breath and remembered that i had lost de garcia and did not know when i should find him again at first i was minded to return and seek him but reflection told me that by now it would be useless also that the end of it might be that i should fall into the hands of the watch who would know me by my wound which began to pain me so i went homeward cursing my fortune and the woman who clasped me from behind just as i was about to send their death thrust home and also well my lack of skill which had delayed that thrust so long twice i might have made it and twice i had waited being over cautious and over anxious to be sure and now i had lost my chance and might bide many a day before he came again how should i find him in this great city doubtless though i had not thought of it the garcia passed under some feigned name as he had done at yarmouth 
it was bitter indeed to have been so near to vengeance and to have missed it by now i was at home and bethought me that i should do well to go to fonseca my master and ask for his help hitherto i had said nothing of his matter to him and i have always loved to keep my own counsel and as yet i had not spoken of my past well, even to him going to the room where he was accustomed to receive patients i found that he had retired to rest leaving orders that i was not to awake him this night as he was weary so i bound up my hurt after a fashion and sought my bed also very ill satisfied with my fortune on the morrow i went to my master's chambers where he still lay abed having been seized by a sudden weakness that was the beginning of the illness which ended in his death as i mixed a draught for him he noticed that my shoulder was hurt and asked me what happened this gave me my opportunity which i was not slow to take have you patience to listen to a story i said for i would seek your help ah he answered it is the old case the physician cannot heal himself speak on nephew then i sat down on the bed and told him keeping nothing back i told him the history of my mother and my father's courtship of my own childhood of the murder of my mother by de garcia and of the oath that i had sworn to be avenged upon him lastly i told him of what had happened upon the previous night and how my enemy had evaded me all the while that i was speaking fonseca wrapped in a rich moorish robe sat up in the bed holding his knees beneath his chin and watching my face with his keen eyes but he spoke no word and made no sign till i had finished the tale you are strangely foolish nephew he said at length for the most part youth fails through rashness but you err by over caution by over caution in your fence you lost your chance last night and so by over caution in hiding this tale from me you have lost a greater opportunity what have you not seen me give counsel in many such matters and have you ever known me to betray the confidence even of the veriest stranger why then did you fear for yours i do not know i answered but i thought that first i would search for myself pride goeth before a fall nephew now listen had i known this history a month ago by now de garcia had perished miserably and not by your hand but by that of the law i have been acquainted with this man from his childhood and know enough to hang him twice over did i choose so to speak more i knew your mother boy and now i see that it was the likeness in your face to hers that haunted me for from the first it was familiar it was also i who bribed the keepers of the holy office to let your father loose though as it chanced i never saw him and arranged his flight since then i have had de garcia through my hands some four or five times now under his name and now under that name once even he came to me as a client but the villainy that he would have worked was too black for me to touch this man is the wickedest whom i have known in seville and that is saying much also he is the cleverest and the most revengeful he lives by vice for vice and there are many deaths upon his hands but he has never prospered in his evil doing and to-day he is but an adventurer without a name who lives by blackmail 
and by ruining women that he may rob them at his leisure. Give me those books from the strong books yonder, and I will tell you of this de Garcia. Well, I did as he bade me, bring in the heavy parchment volumes, each bound in vellum and written in cipher. These are my records, he said, though none can read them except myself. Now, for the index. Ah, ah here it is. Give me volume three and open it at page two hundred and one i obeyed laying the book on the bed before him and he began to read the crabbed marks as easily as though they were a good black letter de garcia juan height appearance family false names and so on ah this is it history now now listen then he came some two pages of closely written matter expressed in secret signs that fonseca translated as he read it was brief enough but such a record as it contained i have never heard before nor since here set out against one man's name was well nigh every wickedness of which a human being could be capable carried through by him to gratify his appetites and revengeful hate and to provide himself with gold in that black list were two murders, one of a rival by knife, and one of a mistress by poison. And there were other things even worse, too shameful, indeed to be written. Doubtless there is more that has not come beneath my notice, said Fonseca coolly, but these things I know for truth, and one of the murders could be proved against him were he captured stay give me ink i must add to the record and he wrote in his cipher in may fifteen hundred and seventeen the said de garcia sailed to england on a trading voyage and there in the parish of ditchingham in the county of norfolk he murdered louisa wingfield spoken of above as louisa de garcia his cousin to whom he was once betrothed in september of the same year or previously under cover of a false marriage he decoyed and deserted one donna isabella of the noble family of siguenza a nun in a religious house in this city what i exclaimed is the girl who came to seek your help two nights since the same that de garcia deserted the very same nephew it was she whom you heard pleading with him last night had i known two days ago what i know to-day by now this villain would be safe in prison but perhaps it is not yet too late i am ill but i will rise and see to it leave it to me nephew go go nurse yourself and leave it to me if anything may be done i can do it stay bid a messenger be ready this evening i shall know whatever there is to be known that night fonseca sent for me again i have made inquiries he said i have even warned the officers of justice for the first time of many years and they are hunting de garcia as bloodhounds hunt a slave but nothing can be heard of him he has vanished and left no trace to-night i write to cadiz for me he may have fled there down the river one thing i have discovered however the senora isabella was caught by the watch and being recognized as having escaped from a convent she was handed over to the executories of the holy office that her case may be investigated or in other words should her fault be proved to death well, can she be rescued impossible had you followed my counsel she would never have been taken Oh, can she be communicated with no twenty years ago 
it might have been managed. Now the office is stricter and purer. Gold has no power there. We shall never see or hear of her again. Unless, indeed, it is at the hour of her death when, should she choose to speak with me, the indulgence may possibly be granted to her, though I doubt it. But it is not likely that she will wish to do so. Should she succeed in hiding her disgrace, she may escape. But it is not probable. Oh, do not look so sad, nephew. Religion must have its sacrifices. Perchance it is better for her to die thus than to live many years dead in life. She can die but once. May her blood lie heavy on de Garcia's head. Amen, I answered. End of chapter 9 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 9 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 9 Thomas Becomes Rich. For many months we heard no more of de Garcia or of Isabella de Seguenza. Both had vanished, leaving no sign, and we searched for them in vain. As for me, I fell back into my former way of life of assistant to Fonseca, posing before the world as his nephew. But it came about that from the night of my duel with the murderer, my master's health declined steadily through the action of a wasting disease of the liver which, which baffled all skill so that within eight months of that time he lay almost bedridden, and at the point of death. His mind, indeed, remained quite clear, and on occasions he would even receive those who came to consult him, reclining on a chair and wrapped in his embroidered robe. But the hand of death lay on him, and he knew that it was so. As the weeks went by, he grew more and more attached to me, till at length, had I been his son, he would not have treated me with any greater affection, while for my part I did what lay in my power to lessen his sufferings, for he would let no other physician near him. At length, when he had grown very feeble, he expressed a desire to see a notary. The man he named was sent for, and remained closeted with him for an hour or more, when he left for a while to return with several of his clerks, who accompanied him to my master's room, from which I was excluded. Presently they all went away, bearing some parchments with them. That evening Fonseca sent for me. I found him very weak but cheerful, and full of talk. Oh, come here, nephew, he said. I have had a busy day. I have been busy all my life through, and <laughs> it would not be well to grow idle at the last. Do you know what I have been doing this day? I shook my head. I will tell you. I have been making a will. There is something to leave. Oh, <laughs> not so very much but still something oh do not talk of wills i said i trust that you will live for many years he laughed you must think badly of my case nephew when you think that i can be deceived thus i uh, i am about to die as you know well and i do not fear death my life has been prosperous, but not happy, for it was blighted in its spring. 
no matter how. The story is an old one and not worth telling. Moreover, whichever way it has read, it had all been won now in the hour of death. We must travel our journey, each of us. What does it matter if the road has been good or bad when we have reached our goal? For my part, religion neither comforts nor frightens me now at the last. I will stand or fall upon the record of my life. Oh, I have done evil in it, and I have done good. The evil I have done, because nature and temptation have been too strong for me at times. The good also, because my heart prompted it. Well, it is now finished. And after all, death cannot be so terrible, seeing that every human being is born to undergo it, together with all living things. Whatever else is false, I hold this to be true, that God exists and is more merciful than those who preach him would have us to believe. At that point he ceased and exhausted. Often since then I have thought of his words, and I still think of them now that my own hour is so near. As will be seen, von Secker was a fatalist, a belief which I do not altogether share, holding as I do that within certain limits we are allowed to shape our own characters and destinies. But his last sayings I believe to be true. God is merciful and death is not so terrible either in its acts or in its consequence. Presently Fonseca spoke again. Why do you lead me to talk of such things? Oh, they weary me, and I have little time. I, I was telling of my will. Nephew, now listen. Except certain sums that I have given to be spent in charities, oh, not in masses, mind you, I have left you all I possessed. What, you have left it to me? I said, astonished. Yes, nephew, to you. But why not? I have no relations living, and I have learned to love you. I who thought that I could never care again for any man or woman or child. I am grateful to you. You have proved to me that my heart is not dead. T take what I give to you as a mark of my gratitude. Now I began to stammer my thanks, but <laughs> he stopped me. The sum that you will inherit, nephew, amounts in all to about, well, about five thousand gold pesos or perhaps twelve thousand of your English pounds. Enough for a young man to begin life on, even with a wife. Indeed, there in England it may be well held a great fortune, and I think that your betrothed's father will make no more objections to you as a son-in-law. Also, there is this house and all it contains, the library and the silver are valuable and you will do well to keep them all is left to you with the fullest formality so that no monies and for the most part the gold lies in strong boxes so that no question can arise as to your right to take it indeed for seeing my end i have of late called in my monies and for the most part the gold lies in strong boxes in the secret cupboard in the wall yonder, that you know of. It would have been more had I known you some years ago, for then, thinking that I grew too rich, who was without an heir, I gave away as much as what remains in acts of mercy and in providing refuge for the homeless and the suffering. Thomas Wingfield for the most part of this money has come to me as the fruit of human folly and human wretchedness, frailty and sin. Use it for the purposes of wisdom 
and the advancing of right and liberty. May it prosper you, and remind you of me, your old master, the Spanish quack, till at last you pass it on to your children, or the poor. And now, one more word. If your conscience will let you, abandon the pursuit of de Garcia. Take your fortune, and go with it to England. Wed that maid whom you desire, and follow that happiness in whatever way it seems best to you. Who are you that you should meet out vengeance on this knave de Garcia? Let him be, and he will avenge himself upon himself. Otherwise you may undergo such toil and danger and in the end lose love and life and fortune at a blow. But I have sworn to kill him, I answered, and how can I break so solemn an oath? How could I sit at home in peace beneath the burden of such shame? I do not know. It is not for me to judge. You must do as you wish but in the doing of it, it may happen that you will fall into greater shames than this. You have fought the man, and he has escaped you. Let him go, if you are wise. Now bend down, and kiss me, and bid farewell. I do not desire that you should see me die, and my death is near. I cannot tell if we shall meet again when, in your turn, you have lain as I lay now, or if we shape our course for different stars. If so, farewell for ever. Then I leant down and kissed him on the forehead. As I did so, I wept, for not till this hour did I learn how truly I had come to love him. So truly that it seemed to me as though my father lay there dying. Oh, weep not, he said, for all our life is but a parting. Once I had a son like you, and ours is not the bitterest of farewells. Now I go to seek for him again who would not come back to me. So weep not, because I die. Good-bye, Thomas Wingfield. May God prosper and protect you. Now, now, go! So I went weeping, and that night, before the dawn, all was over with André de Fonseca. They told me that he was conscious to the end, and died murmuring the name of that son of whom he spoke in his last words to me. What was the history of this son, or of Fonseca himself, I never learned, for like an Indian he hid his trail as step by step he wandered down the path of life. He never spoke of his past, and in all the books and documents that he left behind him there was no illusion to it. Once, some years ago, I read through the cipher of volumes of records that I have spoken of, and of which he gave me the key before he died. They stand before me on the shelf as I write and in them are many histories of shame, sorrow, and evil, of faith deluded and innocence betrayed, of the cruelty of priests, of avarice triumphant over love, and of love triumphant over death. <laughs> enough, enough indeed, to furnish half a hundred of true romances. But among these chronicles of a generation now past and forgotten, there is no mention of Fonseca's own name, and no hint of his own story. It is lost for ever, and perhaps, well, this is well. So died my benefactor and best friend. When he was ready for burial, I went in to see him, and he looked calm and beautiful in his death sleep. Then it was that she, who arrayed him for the grave, handed to me two portraits, most delicately painted on ivory and set in gold, which had been 
found about his neck. I have them yet. One is of the head of a lady with a sweet and wistful countenance, and the other the face of a dead youth also beautiful, but very sad. Doubtless they were mother and son, but I know no more about them. On the morrow I buried Andres de Fonseca, but with no pomp, for he had said that he wished as little money as possible to be spent upon his dead body, and returned to the house to meet the notaries. Then the seals were broken, and the parchments read, and I was put in full possession of the dead man's wealth, and having deducted such sums as were payable in dues, legacies and fees, the notaries left me bowing humbly, for I was not rich. Yes, I was rich, wealth had come to me without effort, and I had reason to desire it. Yet this was the saddest night that I had passed since I set foot in Spain, for my mind was filled with doubts and sorrow, and moreover my loneliness got hold of me. But, sad as it might be, it was destined to seem yet more sorrowful before the morning, for as I was sat, making pretence to eat, a servant came to me saying that a woman waited in the outer room who had asked to see her the late master. Guessing that this was some client who had heard of Fonseca's death, I was about to order that she should be dismissed, then bethought me that I might be of service to her, or at least forget some of my own trouble in listening to hers. So I bade her bring her in. Presently she came, a tall woman, wrapped in a dark cloak that hid her face. I bowed and motioned her to be seated, when suddenly she started and spoke. I asked to see Don André de Fonseca, she said in a low, quick voice. You are not he, senor. André de Fonseca was buried to-day, I answered. I was his assistant in his business, and am his heir. If I can serve you in any way, I am at your disposal. You are, are very young, very young, she murmured confusedly, and the matter is terrible and urgent. How can I trust you? It is for you to judge, Signora. She thought a while, then drew off her cloak, displaying the robes of a nun. Listen, she said. I must do many a penance for this night's work, and very hardly have I won leave to come hither upon an errand of mercy. Now I cannot go back empty-handed, so I must trust you. But first swear thy, by thy blessed mother of God that you will not betray me. I give you my word, I answered. If that is not enough, then let us end this talk. Oh, do not be angry with me, she pleaded. I have not left my convent wall for many years, and I am distraught with grief. I seek a poison of the deadliest. I will pay well for it. I am not the tool of murderers, I answered. For what purpose do you wish this poison? Oh, I must tell you. Yet how can I? In our convent there dies to-night a woman young and fair, almost a girl indeed, who has broken the vows she took. She dies to-night with her baby. Thus, O oh God, thus, by being built alive into the foundations of the house she has disgraced. It is the judgment that has been passed upon her, judgment without forgiveness or reprieve. I am the abbess of this convent. Ask not its name or mine, and I love this sinner as though she were my daughter. I have obtained this much of mercy for her because of my faithful services to the church and by secret influence that when I give her the cup of water before the work is done, I may mix poison with it and touch the lips of the babe with the poison, so that their end is swift. I may do this 
and yet have no sin upon my soul. I have my pardon under seal. Help me, then, to be an innocent murderess, and to save the sinner from the last agonies on earth. I cannot set down the feelings with which I listen to this tale of horror, for words could not carry them. I stood aghast, seeking an answer, and a dreadful thought entered my head. Is this woman named Isabella de Seguenza? I asked. That name was hers in the world, she answered, though how you know it I cannot guess. We know many things in this house, mother. Say now, can this Isabella be saved by money or by interest? Oh, it is impossible. Her sentence has been confirmed by the Tribunal of Mercy. She must die, and within two hours. Oh, will you not give me the poison? I cannot give you it unless I know its purpose, mother. This may be a barren tale, and the medicine may be used in such a fashion that I should fall beneath the law. At one price only I can give it, and it is that I am there to see it used. She thought a while, and answered, It may be done, for as it chances the wordings of my absolution will cover it. But you must be cowled as a priest, that those who carry out the sentence may know nothing. Still others will know, and I warn you that, should you speak of the matter, you yourself will meet with misfortune. The church avenges itself on those who betray its secrets, as one day its secrets will avenge themselves upon the church, I answered bitterly. And now... Let me seek a fitting drug, one that is swift, yet not too swift, lest your hounds should see themselves baffled by the prey before all their devilry is done. Now here is something that will do the work, and I held up a phial that I drew from a case of such medicines. Come, veil yourself, mother, and let us be gone upon this errand of mercy. She obeyed, and presently we left the house and walked away swiftly through the crowded streets till we came to the ancient part of the city along the river's edge. Here the woman led me to a wharf where a boat was waiting for her. We entered it, and were rowed for a mile or more upstream till the boat halted at a landing-place beneath the high wall. Leaving it, we came to a door in a wall on which my companion knocked thrice. Presently a shutter in the woodwork was drawn, and a white face peeped through the grating and spoke. My companion answered in a low voice, and after some delay the door was opened, and I found myself in a large walled garden planted with orange trees. Then the abbess spoke to me again. I have led you to our house, she said, if you know where you are, and what its name is, may be, for your own sake I pray you forget it when you leave these doors. I made no answer, but looked round the dim and dewy garden. Here it was doubtless that de Garcia had met the unfortunate who must die this night. A walk of a hundred paces brought us to another door in the wall of a long low building of Moorish style. Here the knocking and the questionings were repeated at more length. Then the door was opened, and I found myself in a passage, ill-lighted, long and narrow, in the depths of which I could see the figures of nuns flitting to and fro like bats in a tomb. The abbess walked down the passage till she came to the doors on the right which she opened. It led into a cell, where she left me in the dark. For ten minutes or more I stayed there, a prey to thoughts that I had rather forget. At length the door opened again, and she came in, followed by a tall priest, whose face I could not see, for he was dressed in a white robe 
and a hood of the Dominicans that led nothing visible except his eyes. "'Greetings, my son,' he said, when he had scanned me for a while. "'The abbess mother has told me of your errand. "'You are full young for such a task. "'Were I old, I should not love it better, father. "'You know the case. "'I am asked to provide a deadly drug for a certain merciful purpose. "'I have provided that drug, but I must be there to see that it is put to proper use. "'You are very cautious, my son.' The church is no murderess. This woman must die because her sin is flagrant, and of late such wickedness has become common. Therefore, after much thought and prayer and many searchings to find a means of mercy, she is condemned to death by those whose names are too high to be spoken. I alas i am here to see the sentence carried out with a certain mitigation which has been allowed by the mercy of the chief judge it seems that your presence is needful to this act of love therefore i suffer it the mother abbess has warned you that evil dogs the feet of those who reveal the secrets of the church your own sake i pray you to lay that warning to heart i am no babbler father so the caution is not needed one word more this visit should be well feed the medicine is costly oh fear not physician the monk answered and a note of scorn in his voice name your sum it should be paid to you i ask no money father indeed i would pay much to be far away to-night i ask only that i may be allowed to speak with this girl before she dies what he said starting surely you are not that wicked man if so you are bold indeed to risk the sharing of her fate no father i am not that man i never saw isabella de seguenza except once and I have never spoken to her. I am not the man who tricked her, but I know him. He is named Juan de Garcia. Ah, he said quickly, she would never tell his real name, even under threat of torture. Poor erring soul, she could be faithful in her unfaith. Of what would you speak to her? i wish to ask her whither this man has gone he is my enemy and i would follow him as i have already followed him this far he has done worse by me and mine than by this girl even grant my request father that i may be able to work my vengeance on him and with mine the church is also vengeance is mine saith the lord i will repay yet it may be son that the lord will choose you as the instrument of his wrath an opportunity shall be given to you to speak with her now put on this dress and he handed me a white dominican hood and robe and follow me first i said let me give this medicine to the abbess for i will have no hand in its administering take it mother and when the time comes pour the contents of the phial into the cup then having touched the mouth the tongue of the babe with the fluid give it to the mother to drink and be sure that she does drink it before the bricks are built up about them both will sleep sound never to awake again i will do it murmured the abbess having absolution i will be bold and do it for love and mercy's sake oh your heart is too soft sister justice is mercy said the monk with a sigh alas for the frailty of the flesh that wars against the spirit then i clothed myself in the ghastly looking dress and they took lamps and motioned to me to follow them
End of chapter 9 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 10 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 10 The Passing of Isabella de Seguenza. Silently we went down the long passage, and as we went, I saw the eyes of the dwellers in the living tomb, watch us pass through the gratings of their cell doors. Little wonder that that woman, about to die, had striven to escape from such a home back to the world of life and love. Yet for that crime she must perish. Surely God will remember the doings of such men as these priests and the nation that foster them and indeed he does remember for where is the splendour of spain to-day and where are the cruel rights she gloried in here in england their fetters are broken for ever and in striving to bind them fast upon us free englishmen she is broken also never to be whole again at the far end of the passage we found a stair down which we passed. At its foot was an iron-bound door that a monk unlocked, and locked again upon the further side. Then came another passage, hollowed in the thickness of the wall, and a second door, and we were in a place of death. It was a vault, low and damp, and the waters of the river washed its outer wall, for I could hear their murmuring in the silence. Perhaps the place may have measured ten paces in length by eight paces broad. For the rest, its roof was supported by massive columns, and on one side there was a second door that led to a prison cell. At the further end of this gloomy den, that was dimly lighted by torches and lamps, two men with hooded robes and draped in coarse black gowns were at work silently mixing lime that sent up a hot steam upon the stagnant air by their sides were squares of dressed stone ranged neatly against the end of the vault and before them was a niche cut in the thickness of the wall itself shaped like a large coffin set upon a smaller end. In front of this niche was placed a massive chair of wood chestnut wood. I noticed also that two other such coffin-shaped niches had been cut in this same wall, and filled in with the similar blocks of whitish stone. On the face of each was a date graved in deep letters. One had been sealed up some thirty years before, and one hard upon a hundred. These two men were the only occupants of the vault when we entered it, but presently a sound of soft and solemn singing stole down the second passage. Then the door was opened. The mason monks ceased labouring at the heap of lime, and sound of singing grew louder so that I could catch the refrain. It was that of a Latin hymn for the dying. Next through the open door came the choir, eight veiled nuns walking two by two, and ranging themselves on either side of the vault, they ceased their singing. After them followed the doomed woman, guarded by two more nuns, and last of all a priest bearing a crucifix. This man wore a black robe, and his thin, half-frenzied face was uncovered. All of these and other things I noticed and remembered, yet at the same time it seemed to me that I saw nothing except the figure of the victim. I knew her again, although I had seen her but once in the moonlight. 
She was changed indeed. Her lovely face was fuller, and the great tormented eyes shone like stars against a waxen pillar, relieved by the carmine of her lips alone. Still, it was the same face that some eight months before I had seen lifted in entreaty to her false lover. Now her tall shape was wrapped about with grave clothes, over which her black hair streamed, and her arms. She bore a sleeping babe that from time to time she pressed convulsively to her breast. On the threshold of her tomb Isabella de Seguenza paused and looked round wildly, as though for help, scanning each of the silent watches to find a friend among them. Then her eye fell upon the niche and the heap of smoking lime and the men who guarded it, and she shuddered and would have fallen had not those who attended her led her to the chair and placed her in it, a living corpse. Now the dreadful rites began. The Dominican father stood before her and recited her offence and the sentence that had been passed upon her which doomed her to be left alone with god and the child of your sin that he may deal with you as he seals fit to all of this she seemed to pay no heed nor to the exhortation that followed at length he ceased with a sigh and turning to me said draw near to this sinner brother and speak with her before it is too late then he bade all present gather themselves at the far end of the vault that our talk might not be overheard and they did so without wonder thinking doubtless that i was a monk sent to confess the doomed woman so i drew near with a beating heart and bending over her i spoke in her ear listen to me isabella de Seguenza i said and i uttered the name she started wildly where is that de garcia who deceived and deserted you how have you learnt my true name she answered not even torture would have wrung it from me as you know i am no monk and i know nothing i am that man who fought with de garcia on the night when you were taken and who would have killed him had you not seized me at the least I saved him. That is my comfort now. Isabella de Seguenza, I said, I am your friend, the best you ever had, and the last, as you shall learn presently. Tell me where this man is, for there is that between us which must be settled. If you are my friend, weary me no more. I do not know where he is. Months ago he went whither you will scarcely follow, to the furthest Indies. But you will never find him there. It may still be that I shall, and if it should be so by chance, say, have you any message for this man? Oh, none. Oh, yes, this. Tell him how we died, his child and his wife. Tell him that I did my best to hide his name from the priest, lest some like fate should befall him. Is that all? Yes. No, it is not all. Tell him that I passed away, loving and forgiving. My time is short, I said. Awake and listen, for having spoken thus, she seemed to be sinking into a lethargy. I was the assistant of that Andres de Fonseca, whose counsel you put aside to your ruin, and I have given a certain drug to the abbess yonder. When she offers you a cup of water, see that you drink and deep, you and the child, if no one shall ever die more happily. Do you understand? Yes. Yes, she gasped, and may blessings rest upon you for the gift. Now I am no more afraid, for I have long desired to die. It was the way I feared. 
then farewell and god be with you unhappy woman farewell she answered softly but call me not unhappy who am about to die thus easily with that i love and she glanced at the sleeping babe then i drew back and stood with bent head speaking no word now the dominican motioned to all to take their places where they had stood before and asked her erring sister have you aught to say before you are silent for ever yes she answered in a clear sweet voice that never even quavered so bold had she become since she learned that her death would be swift and easy yes i have this to say that i go to my end with a clean heart for if i have sinned it is against custom and not against god i broke the vows indeed but i was forced to take those vows and therefore they did not bind me i was a woman born for light and love and yet i was thrust into the darkness of this cloister there to wither dead in life so i broke the vows and i am glad that i have broken them though it has brought me to this if i was deceived and my marriage is no marriage before the law as they tell me now i knew nothing of it therefore to me it is still valid and holy and on my soul there rests no stain at the least i have lived and for some few hours i have been wife and mother and it is well to die swiftly in the cell that your mercy has prepared as more slowly in those above and now for you i tell you that your wickedness shall find you out you who dare to say to god's children ye shall not love and to work murder on them because they will not listen it shall find you out i say and not only you but the church you serve both priest and church shall be broken together and shall be a scorn in the mouths of men to come oh, she is distraught said the dominican as a sigh of fear and wonder went round the vault and blasphemes in her madness forget her words shrive her brother swiftly here before she adds to them then the black-robed keen-eyed priest came to her and holding the cross before her face began to mutter i know not what but she rose from the chair and thrust the crucifix aside peace she said i will not be shriven by such as you i take my sins to god and not to you you who do murder in the name of christ the fanatic heard and a fury took him then you go unshriven down to hell you and he named her by ill names and struck her in the face with the ivory crucifix the dominican bade him cease his re revilings angrily enough but isabella de seguenza wiped her bruised brow and laughed aloud a dreadful laugh to hear now i see that you are a coward also she said priest this is my last prayer that you also may perish at the hands of fanatics and more terribly than i die to-night then they hurried her into the place prepared for her and she spoke again give me to drink for we thirst my babe and i now i saw the abbess enter the, the passage whence the victim had been led presently she came back bearing a cup of water in her hand and with it a loaf of bread and i knew by her mane that my draught was in the water but of what befell afterwards i cannot say certainly for i prayed the dominican to open the door by which he had entered the vault and passing through it i stood dazed with horror at some distance a while went by i do not know how long till at length i saw the abbess standing before me a lantern in her hand and she was sobbing bitterly all he has done she said 
nay have no fear the draught worked well before ever a stone was laid mother and child slept alas for her soul who died unrepentant and unshriven alas for the souls of all who have shared in this night's work i answered now mother let me hence and may we never meet again then she led me back to the cell where i tore off that accursed monk's robe and thence to the door in the garden wall and to the boat which still waited by the river and i joined to feel the sweet air upon the face as one rejoices who awakes from some foul dream but i won little sleep that night nor indeed for some days to come for whenever i closed my eyes there rose before me the vision of that beauteous woman as i saw her last by the murky torchlight wrapped in grave clothes and standing in the coffin-shaped niche proud and defiant to the end her child clasped with her one arm while the other was outstretched to take the draught of death few have seen such a sight for the holy office and its helpers do not seek witnesses in their dark deeds and none would wish to see it twice oh, if if i have described it ill it is not that i have forgotten but because even now after the lapse of some seventy years i can scarcely bear to write of it or to set out its horrors fully but of all that was wonderful about it perhaps the most wonderful was that even to the last this unfortunate lady should still have clung to her love for the villain who having deceived her by the false marriage deserted her leaving her to such doom to what end can so holy a gift as this great love of hers have been bestowed on such a man none can say but so it was yet now that i think of it there is one thing even stranger than her faithfulness it will be remembered that when the fanatic priest struck her she prayed that he also might die at such hands and more terribly than she must do well, so it came about in after years that very man father pedro by name was sent to convert the heathen of anahuac among whom because of his cruelty he was known as the christian devil but it chanced that venturing too far among the clan of the otomi before they were finally subdued he fell into the hands of some priests of the war god huitzel and by them was sacrificed after their dreadful fashion i saw him as he went to his death and without telling that i should be present when it was uttered i called to his mind the dying curse of isabel de Sergüenza. then for a moment his courage gave way for seeing in me nothing but an indian chief he believed that the devil had put the words into my lips to torment him causing me to speak of what i knew nothing but enough of this now if it is necessary i will tell of it in its proper place at least whether it was by chance or because she had a gift of vision in her last hours or that providence was arranged on him after his fashion so it came about and i do not sorrow for it though the death of this priest brought much misfortune on me this then was the end of isabella de Seguenza, who was murdered by priests because she dared to break their rule so soon as i could clear my mind somewhat of all that i had seen and heard in that dreadful vault i began to consider the circumstances to which i found myself in the first place i was now a rich man and if it pleased me to go back to norfolk with my wealth as fonseca had pointed out my prospects were fair indeed but the oath that i had taken hung like lead about my neck 
I had sworn to be avenged upon de Garcia, and I had prayed that the curse of heaven might rest upon me until it was so avenged. But in England, living in peace and plenty, I could scarcely come by vengeance. Moreover, now I knew where he was, or at least of what portion of the world I might seek him, and there, where white men are few, he could not hide from me as in Spain. This tidings I had gained from the doomed lady, and I have told her story at some length because it was through it and her that I came to journey to Hispaniola, as it was because of the sacrifice of her tormentor, Father Pedro, by the priests of the Otomi that I am here in England this day. Since had it not been for that sacrifice, the Spaniards would never have stormed the city of Pines, where, alive or dead, I should doubtless have been to this hour. For thus do seeming accidents build up the fates of men. Had those words never passed Isabella's lips, doubtless in time I should have wearied of a useless search and sailed for home and happiness. But having heard them, it seemed to me to my undoing, that this would be to play the part of a sorry coward. Moreover, strange as it may look, now I felt as though I had two wrongs to avenge, that of my mother and that of Isabella de Seguenza. Indeed, none could have seen that young and lovely lady die thus terribly and not desire to wreak her death on him who had betrayed and deserted her. So the end of it was that being of a stubborn temper, I determined to do violence to my own desires and the dying counsels of my benefactor, and to follow de Garcia to the ends of the earth, and there to kill him as I had sworn to do. First, However, I inquired secretly and diligently as to the truth of the statement that de Garcia had sailed for the Indies, and to be brief, having the clue, I discovered that two days after the date of the duel I had fought with him, a man, answering to de Garcia's description, though bearing a different name, had shipped from Seville in Carac, bound for the Canary Islands which Carac was there to await the arrival of the fleet sailing for Hispaniola. Indeed, from various circumstances, I had little doubt that the man was none other than de Garcia himself, which, although I had not thought of it before, was not strange, seeing that then, as now, the Indies were the refuge of half the desperados and villains who could no longer live in Spain. Thither, then I made up my mind to follow him, consoling myself a little by the thought that at least I should see new and wonderful countries, though how new and wonderful they were I did not guess. Now it remained for me to dispose of the wealth which had come to me suddenly. While I was wondering how I could place it safely till my return, I heard by chance that the adventurous of Yarmouth, the same ship in which I had come to Spain a year before, was again in the port of Cadiz, and bethought me that the best thing I could do with the gold and the other articles of value would be to ship them to England, there to be held in trust for me. So, having dispatched a message to my friend the captain of the adventurous, that I had freight of value for him, I made my preparations to depart from Seville with such speed as I might, and to this end I sold my benefactor's house, with many of the effects, at a price much below their worth. The most of the books and plate, together with some of the articles I kept, and packing them in cases, I caused them to be transported down the river to Cadiz, to the care of those same agents to whom I had received letters from the Yarmouth merchants. This being done, I followed thither myself, taking the bulk of my fortune with me in gold, which I hid artfully in no numerous packages. And so it came to pass that after a stay of a year in Seville, I turned my back on it for ever. My sojourn there had been fortunate, for I came to it poor 
and I left it a rich man, to say nothing of what I had gained in experience, which was much. Yet I was glad to be gone, for here Juan de Garcia had escaped me. Here I had lost my best friend, and seen Isabella de Siguenza die. I came to Cadiz in safety and without loss of any of my goods or gold, and taking boat proceeded on board the adventuress, where I found her captain, whose name was Bell, in good health and very glad to see me. What pleased me more, however, was that he had three letters for me, one from my father, one from my sister Mary, and one from my betrothed, Lily Bozard, the only letter I ever received from her. The contents of these writings were not altogether pleasing, however, for I learned from them that my father was in broken health and almost bedridden, and indeed, though I did not know it for many years after, he died at Ditchingham Church upon the very day that I received his letter. It was short and sad, and in it he said that he sorrowed much that he had allowed me to go upon my mission, since he should see me no more, and could only commend to me the care of the Almighty, and pray him for my safe return. As for Lily's letter, which, hearing that the adventuress was to sail for Cadiz, she had found means to dispatch secretly, though it was not short, it was sad also, and told me that so soon as my back was turned on home, my brother Geoffrey had asked her in marriage from her father, and that they pushed the matter strongly, so that her life was made a misery to her. For my brother waylaid her everywhere, and her father did not cease to revile her as an obstinate jade who would fling away her fortune for the sake of a penniless wanderer. But, it went on, be assured, sweetheart, that until they marry me by force, as they have threatened to do, I will not budge for my promise. And, Thomas, should I be wedded thus against my will, I shall not be a wife for long, for though I am strong, I believe that I shall die of shame and sorrow. It is hard that I should be thus tormented, and for one reason only, that you are not rich. Still, I have good hope that things may better themselves, for I see that my brother Wilford is such inclined towards your sister Mary, and though he urges this marriage on me to-day, she is a friend to both of us, and she may be in the way to make terms with him before she accepts his suit. Then the writing ended, with many tender words and prayers for my safe return. As for the letter from my sister Mary, it was to the same purpose. As yet, she said, she could do nothing for me with Lily Bozard, for my brother Geoffrey was mad with love for her. My father was too ill to meddle in the matter, and Squire Bozard was fiercely set upon the marriage, because of the lands that were at stake. Still, she hinted things might not always be so as a time might come when she could speak up for me, and not in vain. Now all this news gave me much cause for thought. More, indeed, it awoke in me a longing for home, which was so strong that it grew almost to a sickness. Her loving words and the perfume that hung about the letter of my betrothed brought Lily back to me in such sort that my heart ached with a desire to be with her. Moreover, I knew that I should be welcome now, for my fortune was far greater than my brother's would ever be, and parents do not show the door to suitors who bring more than twelve thousand golden pieces in their baggage. Also, I wished to see my father again before he passed beyond my reach. But still, between me and my desire lay the shadow of de Garcia and my oath. I had brooded on vengeance for so long that I felt even in the midst of this strong temptation that I should have no pleasure in my life if I forsook my quest. To be happy, I must first kill de Garcia. Moreover, 
I had come to believe that did I so forsake it the curse which I had invoked would surely fall upon me. Meanwhile I did this. Going to a notary I caused him to prepare a deed which I translated into English. By this deed I vested all my fortune, except two hundred pesos that I kept for my own use, in three persons to hold the same on my behalf till I came to claim it. Those three persons were my old master, Dr. Grimstone, of Bungay, whom I knew for being an honest man, my sister Mary Wingfield, and my betrothed, Lily Bozard. I directed them by this deed, which, for greater validity, I signed upon the ship and caused to be witnessed by Captain Bell and two other Englishmen, to deal with the property according to their discretion investing not less than half of it in the purchase of lands, and putting the rest out to interest, which interest with the rent of the lands was to be paid to the said Lily Bozard for her own use, for so long as she remained unmarried. Also, with the deed I executed a will, by which I devised most of the property to Lily Bozard, should she be unmarried at the date of my death, and the residue to my sister Mary. In the event of marriage or death of Lily, then the whole was to pass to Mary and her heirs. These two documents being signed and sealed, I delivered them, together with all my treasure and other goods, into the keeping of Captain Bell, charging him solemnly to hand them and my possessions to Dr. Grimstone of Bungay, by whom he would be liberally rewarded. This he promised to do, though not until he had urged me, almost with tears, to accompany my, them myself. With the gold and deeds I sent several letters to my father, my sister, my brother, Dr. Grimstone, Squire Bozard, and lastly to Lily herself. In these letters I gave an account of my life and fortune since I come to Spain, for I gathered that others which I had sent had never reached England, and told them of my resolution to follow de Garcia to the ends of the earth. Others, I wrote to Lily, may think me a madman thus to postpone, or perchance to lose, a happiness which I desire above anything on earth. But you who understand my heart will not blame me, however much you may grieve for my decision. You will know that when once I have set my mind upon an object, nothing except death itself can turn me from it, and that in this matter I am bound by an oath which my conscience will not suffer me to break. I could never be happy, even at your side, if I abandoned my search now. First come the toil, and then the rest, first the sorrow, and then the joy. Oh, do not fear for me. I feel that I shall live to return again, and if I do not return, at least I am able to provide for you in such fashion that you need never be married against your will. While de Garcia lives, I must follow him. To my brother Geoffrey I wrote very shortly, telling him what I thought of his conduct in persecuting an undefended maiden and striving to do wrong to an absent brother. I have heard that my letter pleased him very ill. And here I may state that those letters and everything else that I sent came safely to Yarmouth. There the gold and goods were taken to Lowestoft and put aboard a wherry, and when he had discharged his ship, Captain Bell sailed up the Waveney with them till he brought them to Bungay Staith and thence to the house of Dr. Grimstone in Nethergate Street. Here were gathered my sisters and brother, for my father was two months buried, and also Squire Bozard and his son and daughter, for Captain Bell had advised them of his coming by messenger, and when all the tale was told, there was wonder and to spare. Still greater did it grow when the chests were opened, and the weight of bullion compared with that set out in my letters, for there had never been so much gold at once in Bungay, 
within the memory of man. And now Lily wept, first for joy because of my good fortune, and then for sorrow because I had not come home with my treasure. And when he had seen all and heard the deeds read by virtue of which Lily was a rich woman, whether I lived or died, the squire, her father, swore aloud, and said that he had always thought well of me, and kissed his daughter, wishing her joy of her luck. In short, all were pleased, except my brother, who left the house without a word, and straightway took to evil courses. For now the cup was dashed from his lips, seeing that having come into my father's lands, he had brought it about that Lily was to be married to him, by might, if no other means would serve. For even now a man can force his daughter into marriage while she is under age, and Squire Bozard was not one to shrink from such a deed, holding as he did that a woman's fancies were of no account. But on this day, so great is the power of gold, there was no more talk of her marrying any man except myself. Indeed, her father would have held her back from such a thing had she shown a mind to it, seeing that then Lily would have lost the wealth which I had settled on her. But all talked loudly of my madness because I would not abandon the chase of my enemy, but choose to follow him to the far Indies, though Squire Bozard took comfort from the thought that whether I lived or died, the money was still with his daughters. Only Lily spoke up for me, saying, Thomas has sworn an oath, and he does well to keep it, for his honour is at stake. How I go to wait until he comes to me, in this world or the next. But all of this is out of place, for many a year passed before I heard of these doings. End of chapter 10 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 11 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 11 The Loss of the Carrack. On the day after I had given my fortune and letters into the charge of Captain Bell, I watched the adventurous drop slowly round the mole of Cadiz and so sad was I at heart that I am not ashamed to confess that I wept. I would gladly have lost the wealth she carried if she had but carried me. But my purpose was indomitable, and it must be some other ship that would bear me home to the shores of England. As it chanced, a large Spanish carrack named Las Cinque Yagas, or the Five Wounds, was about to sail for Hispaniola, and having obtained a license to trade, I took a passage in her under my assumed name of Delia, passing myself off as a merchant. To further this deception, I purchased goods and value of a, of 105 pesos, and of such a nature, as I was informed, were most readily saleable in the Indies, where merchandise I shipped with me. The vessel was full of Spanish adventurers, mostly ruffians, and varied career and strange history, but none the less they were good companions enough when not in the drink. By this time I could speak Castilian so perfectly and was so Spanish in appearance that it was not difficult for me to pass myself off as one of their nation, and this I did, inventing a feigned tale of my parentage and of the reasons that led me to tempt the seas. For the rest, now as ever I kept my own counsel, and notwithstanding my reserve, for I would not mingle in their orgies, I soon became well liked by my comrades, chiefly because my skill in ministering to their sicknesses. Of our voyage there is little to tell except of its sad end. At the Canary Isles, 
We stayed a month, and then sailed away for Hispaniola, meeting with fine weather but light winds. When, as our captain reckoned, we were within a week's sail of the port of San Domingo, for which we were bound, the weather changed, and presently gathered to a furious tempest from the north that grew more terrible every hour. For three days and nights our cumbrous vessel groaned and laboured beneath the stress of the gale, that drove us on rapidly, we knew not where, till at length it became clear that, unless the weather moderated, we must founder. Our ship leaked at every scene. One of our masts was carried away, and another broken in two, at a height of twenty feet from the deck. But all these more misfortunes were small compared to what was to come, for on the fourth morning a great wave swept off our rudder, and we drifted helpless before the seas. Then began our most horrible scene. For several days both the crew and passengers had been drinking heavily to allay their terror, and now that they saw their end at hand, they rushed to and fro screaming and praying and blaspheming. Such of them as remained sober, began to get out the two boats, into which I and another man, a worthy priest, strove to place the women and children, of whom we had several on board. But this was no easy task, for the drunken sailors pushed them aside and tried to spring into the boats, the first of which overturned, so that all were lost. Just then the carrot gave a lurch before she sank, and— Seeing that everything was over, I called to the priest to follow me, and springing into the sea I swam for the second boat, which laden with some shrieking women had drifted loose in the confusion. As it chanced, I reached it safely, being a strong swimmer, and was able to rescue the priest before he sank. Then the vessel reared herself upon her stern, and floated thus for a minute or more, which gave us time to get the oars out and row some fathoms further away from her. Scarcely had we done so when, with one wild and scree, fearful scream from those on board of her, she rushed down into the depths below, nearly taking us with her. For a while we sat silent, for our horror overwhelmed us, but when the whirlpool which she made had ceased to boil, we rowed back to where the carrack had been. Now all the sea was strewn with wreckage, but among it we found only one child living that had clung to an oar. The rest, some two hundred souls, had been sucked down with ship and perished miserably, or if there were still any living, we could not find them in the weltering sea over which the darkness was falling. Indeed, it was well for our own safety that we failed in doing so, for the little boat had ten souls on board in all, which was as many as she could carry, the priest and I being the only men among them. I have said that the darkness was falling, and as it chanced happily for us, so was the sea, or assuredly we must have been swamped. All that we could do was to keep the boat's head straight to the waves and this we did through the long night. It was a strange thing to see, or rather to hear, that good man the priest, my companion, confessing the women one by one as he laboured at his oar, and when all were shriven sending up prayers to God for the salvation of our souls, for of the safety of our bodies we despaired, what I felt may well be imagined, but I forbear to describe it, seeing that, Bad as was my case, there were worse ones before me, of which I shall have to tell in their season. At length the night wore away, and the dawn broke upon the desolate sea. Presently the sun came up, for which we were thankful, for we were chilled to the bone. But soon its heat grew intolerable, since we had neither food nor water in the boat, and already we were parched with thirst, but now the wind had fallen into a steady breeze, and with the help of the oars and a blanket, we contrived to fashion a sail that drew us through the water at a good speed. 
but the ocean was vast, and we did not know whither we were sailing, and every hour the agony of thirst pressed us more closely. Towards midday a child died suddenly, and was thrown into the sea, and some three hours later the mother filled a bailing bowl and drank deep of the bitter water. For a while it seemed to assuage her thirst, then suddenly a madness took her, and springing up she cast herself overboard and sank. Before the sun, glowing like a red-hot ball, had sunk beneath the horizon, the priest and I were the only ones in that company who could sit upright. The rest lay upon the bottom of the boat, heaped one on another, like dying fish, groaning in their misery. Oh, night fell at last, and brought us some relief from our suffering, for the air grew cooler. But the rain we prayed for did not fall, and so great was the heat that, when the sun rose again in a cloudless sky, we knew, if no help reached us, that it must be the last which we would see. An hour after dawn, another child died, and as we were in the act of casting the body into the sea, I looked up and saw a vessel far away that seemed to be sailing in such fashion that she would pass within two miles of where we were, returning thanks to God for this most blessed, blessed sight we took to the oars, for the wind was now so light that our clumsy sails would no, no longer draw us through the water, and rowed feebly so as to cut the path of the ship. When we had laboured for more than an hour, the wind fell altogether, and the vessel lay becalmed at a distance of about three miles, so that the priest and I rowed on until I thought that we must die in the boat for the heat of the sun was like that of a flame, and there were no wind to temper it. By now, till our lips were cracked with thirst, still we struggled on till the shadow of the ship's mast fell athwart us, and we saw her sailors watching us from the deck. Now we were alongside, and they let down a ladder of rope, speaking to us in Spanish. How we reached the deck I cannot say, but I remember falling beneath the shade of an awning and drinking cup after cup of the water that was brought to me. At last even my thirst was satisfied, and for a while I grew faint and dizzy and had no stomach for meat which was thrust into my hands. Indeed, I think that I must have fainted, for when I came to myself the sun was straight overhead and it seemed to me that I had dreamed I... I heard a familiar and hateful voice. At the time I was alone beneath the awning, for the crew of the ship were gathered on the foredeck, clustering around what appeared to be the body of a man. By my side was a large plate of victuals, and a flask of spirits, and feeling stronger I ate and drank of them heartily. I had scarcely finished my meal, when the men on the foredeck lifted the body of the man, which I saw was black in colour, and cast it overboard. Then three of them, whom from their port I took to be officers, came towards me, and I rose to my feet to meet them. Signor, said the tallest of them, in a soft and gentle voice, suffer me to offer you our felicitations of your wonderful. And he stopped suddenly. Did I still dream, or did I know the voice? Now for the first time I could see the man's face. It was that of Juan de Garcia, but if I knew him, he also knew me. Caramba, he said, whom have we here? Senor Thomas Wingfield, I salute you. Look, my comrades, you see this man whom the sea has brought to us? He is no Spaniard, but an English spy. The last time I saw him was in the streets of Seville. There he tried to murder me because I threatened to reveal his trade to the authorities. Now he is here, upon what errand he knows best. It is false, I answered, 
I am no spy, and I come to these seas for one purpose only, to find you. Then you have succeeded well, too well for your own comfort, perhaps. Say now, do you deny that you are Thomas Wingfield, an Englishman? I do not deny it. I— Your pardon. How comes it, then, that, as your companion the priest tells me, you sailed in Las Sank Yagas under the name of Delia? For my own reasons, Juan de Garcia. Oh, you are confused, senor. My name is Arcada, as this gentleman can bear witness. Once I knew a cavalier of the name de Garcia, uh, but he is dead. You lie, I answered. Whereupon, one of de Garcia's companions struck me across the mouth. "'Gently, friend,' said de Garcia, "'do not defile your hand by striking such rats as this, "'or if you must strike, well, use a stick. "'You have heard that he confesses to passing under a false name "'and to being an Englishman, and therefore one of your country's foes. "'To this I add upon my word of honour that, to my knowledge, "'he is a spy, and a would-be murderer. "'Now, gentlemen,' under the commission of his majesty's representative we are judges here but since you may think that having been called a liar openly by this english dog i might be minded to deal unjustly with him so i prefer to leave the matter in your hands now i try to speak once more but the spaniard who struck me a ferocious looking villain drew his sword, and swore that he would run me through if I dared to open my lips. So I thought it well to keep silent. "'This English man would grace a yard arm very well,' he said. De Garcia, who had begun to hum a tune indifferently, smiled, looking first at the yard, and then my neck, and the hate in his eyes seemed to burn me. I have a better thought than that, said the third officer. If we hung him, questions might be asked, and at the least it would be a waste of good money. He is a finely built young man, and would last some years in the mines. Let him be sold with the rest of the cargo, or I will take him myself at a valuation. I am in want of a few such on my estate. At those words I saw de Garcia's face fall a little, for he wished to be rid of me for ever. Still, he did not think it politic to interfere, beyond saying with a slight yawn, So far as I am concerned, take him, comrade, and free of cost. Only, I warn you, watch him well, or you will find a stiletto in your back. The officer laughed and said, Our friend will scarcely get a chance at me, for I do not go a hundred paces underground, where he will find his quarters. And now, the Englishman, there is room for you below, I think. And he called a sailor, bidding him to bring the irons of the man who had died. This was done, and after I had been searched, and a small sum in gold that I had upon my person taken from me, it was all that remained to me of my possessions. Fetters were placed upon my ankles and around my neck, and I was dragged into the hold. Before I reached it, I knew from various signs what was the cargo of this ship. He was laden with slaves captured in Fernandina, as the Spaniards named the island of Cuba, that were to be sold in Hispaniola. Among these slaves I was now numbered. How to tell the horrors of that hold I know not. The place was low, not more than seven feet in height, and the slaves lay ironed in the bilge water at the bottom of the vessel. They were crowded as thick as they could lie, being chained to rings fixed to the sides of the ships. Altogether there may have been two hundred of them, men, women, and children, or rather, there had been two hundred when the ship sailed a week before. Now some twenty were dead, which was a small number since the Spaniards reckoned to lose from a third to half of their cargo of this devilish traffic. When I entered the place, 
a deadly sickness seized me. Weak as I was, brought on by the horrible sounds and smells, and the sights that I saw of the flare of the lanterns which my conductors carried, for the hold was shut off from light and air. But they dragged me along, and presently I found myself chained in the midst of a line of black men and women, many feet resting in the bilge-water. There the Spaniard left me with a jeer, saying that this was too good for a bed for an Englishman to lie on. For a while I endured. Then sleep, or insensibility, came to my succour, and I sank into oblivion, and so I must have remained for a day and a night. When I awoke, it was to find the Spaniard to whom I had been sold or given, standing near me with a lantern and directing the removal of the fetters from a woman who was chained next to me. She was dead, and in the light of the lantern I could see that she had been carried off by some horrible disease that was new to me, but which I afterwards learned to know by the name of Black Vomit. Nor was she the only one, for I counted twenty dead who were dragged out in succession, and I could see that many more were sick. Also I saw that the Spaniards were not a little frightened, for they could make nothing of this sickness, and strove to lessen it by cleansing the hold and letting air into it by the removal of some planks in the, in the deck above. Had they not done this, I believe that every soul of us must have perished and I set down my own escape from the sickness to the fact that the largest opening in the deck was made directly a, above my head, so that by standing up, which my chains allowed me to do, I could breathe the air that was almost pure. Having distributed water and meal cakes, the Spaniard went away. I drank greedily of the water, but the cakes I could not eat, for they were mouldy. The sights and sounds around me were so awful that I will not try to write of them, and all the while we sweltered in their terrible heat, for the sun pierced through the deck plankings of the vessel, and I could feel by her lack of motion that we were becalmed and drifting. I stood up, and by resting my heels upon the rib of the ship and my back against her side, I found myself in a position whence I could see the feet of the passers-by on the deck above. Presently I saw that one of them wore a priest's robe, and guessing that he must be a companion with whom I had escaped, I strove to attract his notice, and at length I succeeded. So soon as he knew who it was beneath him, the priest lay down on the deck as though to rest himself, and we spoke together. He told me, as I had guessed, that we were becalmed, and that a great sickness had taken hold of the ship, already laying low a third of the crew, adding that it was a judgment from heaven because of their cruelty and wickedness. To this I answered that the judgment was working on the captives as well as the captors, and asked him where Sarcada, as they named de Garcia, then I learned that he had been taken sick that morning and I rejoiced at the news, for if I had hated him before, it may be judged how deeply I hated him now. Presently the priest left me and returned with water mixed with fruit juices of limes, that tasted to me like nectar from the gods, and some good meat and fruit. These he gave me through the hole in the planks, and I made shift to seize them by my manacled hands and devoured them. That day passed, and a long night passed, and when at length the Spaniards visited the hold once more, there were forty bodies to be dragged out of it, and many others were sick. After they gone I stood up, watching for my friend the priest, but he did not come, nor ever again. End of chapter 11 Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter twelve of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter twelve. Thomas comes to shore. For an hour or more, I stood craning my neck upwards to seek for the priest. At length, when I was about to sink back into the hold for I could stand no longer in that cramped posture, I saw a woman's dress pass by the hole in the deck, and knew it for one who was worn by a lady who had escaped with me in the boat. "'Signora!' I whispered. "'For the love of God, listen to me. It is I, Delia, who am chained down here among the slaves.' She started. Then, as the priest had done, she sat herself down upon the deck and I told her of my dreadful plight, not knowing that she was acquainted with it, and of the horrors below. Alas, Signor, she answered, they can be a little worse than those above. Her dreadful sickness is raging among the crew. Six are already dead, and many more are raving in their last madness. I would that the sea had swallowed us with the rest, for we have been rescued from it only to fall into hell. Already my mother is dead, and my little brother is dying. Where is the priest? I asked. Oh, he died this morning, and has just been cast into the sea. Before he died I spoke of you, and prayed me to help you if I could. But his words were wild, and I thought that he might be distraught. And indeed, how can I help you? perhaps you can find me food and drink i answered and for our friend god rest his soul what of the captain sarcada is he also dead no signor he alone is recovering of all whom the scourge has smitten and now i must go to my brother but first i will seek food for you she went, and presently returned with meat and a flask of wine which she had hidden beneath her dress. And I ate, and I blessed her. For two days she fed me thus, bringing me food at night. On the second night she told me that her brother was dead, and of all the crew only fifteen men and one officer remained untouched by the sickness, and that she herself grew ill also she said that the water was almost finished and there was little food left for the slaves after this she came no more and i suppose that she died also it was within twenty hours of her last visit that i left this accursed ship for a day none had come to feed or tend the slaves and indeed many needed no tended for they were dead some still lived however though so far as I could see, the most of them were smitten with the plague. I myself had escaped the sickness, perhaps because of the strength and natural healthiness of my body, which has always saved me from fevers and diseases, fortified as it was with good food that I had obtained. But now I knew that I could not live long. Indeed, chained in this dreadful charnel-house i prayed for death to release me from the horrors of such existence the day passed as before in sweltering heat unbroken by any air or motion the night came at last made hideous by the barbarous ravings of the dying but even there and then i slept and dreamed that i was walking with my love in the vale of waveney Towards the morning I was awakened by the sound of clanking iron, and opening my eyes I saw that men were at work, by the light of the lanterns, knocking the fetters from the dead and the living together. As the fetters were loosed, a rope was put round the body of the slave, and dead or quick he was hauled through a hatchway. Presently a heavy splash in the water without told the rest of the tale. Now I understood that all the slaves were being thrown overboard because of the want of water, and in the hope that it might avail to save from the pestilence those of the Spaniards who still remained alive. I watched them at their work for a while, 
till there were but two slaves between me and the workers, of whom one was living and the other was dead. Then I bethought me that this would be my fate also, to be cast quick into the sea, and counsel myself as to whether I should declare that I was whole from the plague, and pray them to spare me, or whether I should suffer myself to be drowned. The desire for life was strong, but perhaps it may serve to show how great were the torments from which I was suffering, and how broken was my spirit by misfortunes and the horrors around me when I say that I determined to make no effort to live, but rather to accept death as a merciful release. And indeed, I knew that there was little likelihood of such attempts being of avail, for I saw that the Spanish sailors were mad with fear, and had but one desire, to rid of the slaves who consumed the water, and as they believed, had bred the pestilence. So I said such prayers as came into my head, and although with a great shivering of fear, for the poor flesh shrinks from its end, and the unknown beyond it, however high may be the spirit, I prepared myself to die. Now, having dragged away my neighbour in misery, the living savage, the men turned to me. They were naked to the middle, and worked furiously to be done with their hateful task, sweating with the heat, and keeping themselves from fainting by draughts of spirit. "'This one is alive also, and does not seem so sick,' said a man, as he struck the fetters from me. "'Alive or dead, away with the dog,' answered another hoarsely, and I saw that it was the same officer to whom I had been given as a slave. "'It is that Englishman.' and he it is who brought us this ill luck. Cast the Jonah overboard, and let him try his evil eye upon the sharks. So be it, answered the other man, and finished striking off my fetters. Those who have come to a cup of water each day do not press their guests to share it. They show them the door. Say your prayers, Englishman, and may they do more good than they have done for most on this accursed ship. Here, this is the stuff to make drowning easy, and there is more of it on board than of water. And he handed me the flask of spirit. I took it and drank deep, and it comforted me a little. Then they put the rope round me, and at a signal those on the deck above began to haul till I swung loose beneath the hatchway. As I passed that Spaniard to whom I had given in slavery, and who but now had counselled my casting away. I saw his face well in the light of the lantern, and there were signs on it that a physician could read clearly. Farewell, I said to him. We may meet soon again. Fool, why do you labour? Take your rest, for the plague is on you. In six hours you will be dead. His jaw dropped with terror at my words and for a moment he stood speechless. Then he uttered a fearful oath, and aimed a blow at me with the hammer he held, which would have swiftly put an end to my suffering, had I not at that moment been lifted from his reach by those who pulled above. In another second I had fallen on the deck, and they slacked the rope. Near me stood two black men, whose office it was to cast us poor wretches into the sea, and behind them, seated in a chair, his face haggard from recent illness, sat de Garcia, fanning himself with his sombrero, for the night was very hot. He recognized me at once in the moonlight, which was brilliant, and said, What? Are you here and still alive, cousin? You are tough indeed. I thought that you must be dead or dying. Indeed, had it not been for this accursed place, I would have seen to it myself. Well, it has come right at last, and here is the lonely lucky thing in this old voyage, that I shall have the pleasure of sending you to the sharks. It consoles me for much, friend Wingfield. So, you came across the seas to seek vengeance on me. 
Well, I hope that your stay has been pleasant. The accommodation was a little poor, but at least the welcome was hearty. And now it is time to speed the parting guest. Good night, Thomas Wingfield. <coughs> if you should chance to meet your mother presently, tell her from me that I was grieved to have to kill her, for she is the one being whom I have loved. I did not come to murder her, as you have thought, but she forced me to it to save myself, since had I not done so, I should never have lived to return to Spain. She had too much of my own blood to suffer me to escape, and it seems that it runs strong in your veins also, else you would scarcely hold so fast by vengeance. Well, it has not prospered you. And he dropped back into the chair, and fell to fanning himself again with that broad hat. Even then, as I stood under the eve of death, I felt my blood run hot within me at the sting of his coarse taunts. Truly, de Garcia's triumph was complete. I had come to hunt him down, and what was the end of it? He was about to hurl me to the sharks. Still I answered him with such dignity as I could command. "'You have me at some disadvantage,' I said. "'Now, if there is any manhood left in you, give me a sword, and let us settle our quarrel once and for all. You are weak from sickness, I know. But what am I, who have spent certain days and nights in this hell of yours?' We should be well matched, de Garcia. <laughs> Perhaps so, cousin. But where is the need? To be frank, things have not gone over well with me when we stood face to face before, and it is odd. But do you know, I have been troubled with the foreboding that you would be the end of me. That is one of the reasons why I sought a change of air to these warmer regions. But see the folly of foreboding, my friend. I am still alive, though I have been ill, and I mean to go on living. But you are, forgive me for mentioning, you are already dead. Indeed, those gentlemen— and he pointed to the two black men who had taken advantage of our talk to throw into the sea the slave who followed me up the hatchway, are waiting to put a stop to our conversation. Have you any message that I can deliver for you? If so, out with it, for time is short, and that hold must be cleared by daybreak. I have no message to give you from myself, though— I have a message for you, de Garcia, I answered. But before I tell it, let me say a word. You seem to have won, wicked murderer as you are, but perhaps the game is not yet played. Your fears may still come true. I am dead, but my vengeance may yet live on, for I leave it to the hand in which I should have left it first. You may live some years longer, but do you think that you will escape? One day you will die as surely as I must die to-night. And what then, de Garcia? <laughs> a truce, I pray you, he said with a sneer. Surely you have not been consecrated, priest. You had a message, you said. Pray deliver it quickly. Time presses, cousin Wingfield. Who sends a message to an, an exile like myself? Isabella de Seguenza, whom you cheated with a false marriage and abandoned, I said. He started from his chair and stood over me. What of her? he whispered fiercely. Only this. The monks walled her up alive with her baby. Walled her up alive? Mother of God, how do you know that? I chanced to see it done, that is all. She prayed me to tell you of her end, 
and the child's, and that she died hiding your name, loving and forgiving. This was all her message, but I will add to it. May she haunt you for ever, she and my mother. May they haunt you through your life and death, through earth and hell. He covered his face with his hands for a moment, then dropping them, sank back into the chair and called to the black sailors. Away with the slave! Why are you so slow? The two men advanced upon me, but I was not minded to be handled by them if I could help it, and I was minded to cause de Garcia to share my fate. Suddenly I bounded at him and gripped him round the middle. I dragged him from the chair. Such was the strength that rage and despair gave me that I succeeded in swinging him up to the level of the bulwarks. But there the matter ended, for at that moment the two black sailors sprang upon us both and tore him from my grip. Then seeing that all was lost, for they were about to cut me down with their swords, I placed my hand upon the bulwark and leaped into the sea. My reason told me that I should do well to drown quickly as possible, and I thought to myself that I would not try to swim, but would sink at once. Yet love of life was too strong for me, and so soon as I touched the water, I struck out and began to swim along the side keeping myself in her shadow, for I feared lest de Garcia should cause me to be shot with at arrows and musket-balls. Presently, as I went, I heard him say with an oath, He has gone, and for good this time, but my foreboding went near to coming true after all. Ah, how the sight of that man frightens me! Now, I knew in my heart that I was doing a mad thing, for though, if no shark took me, I might float for six or eight hours in this warm water, yet I must sink at last, and what would be the struggle have profited me? Still, I swam on slowly, and after the filth and stench of the slavehold, the touch of the clean water and the breath of the pure air were like food and wine to me, and I felt strength enter into me as I went. By the time I was a hundred yards from the ship, and though those on board could scarcely have seen me, I could still hear the splash of bodies as the slaves were flung from her, and the drowning cries of such among them as still lived. I lifted my head and looked round the waste of water, and seeing something floating on it at a distance, I swam towards it expecting that every moment would be my last because of the sharks which abound in these seas. Soon I was near it, and to my joy I perceived that it was a large barrel, which had been thrown from the ship and was floating upright in the water. I reached it, and pushing at it from below, contrived to tilt it so that I caught its upper edge with my hand. Then I saw that it was half full of meal cakes, and that it had been cast away because the meal was stinking. It was the weight of those rotten cakes acting as ballast that caused the tub to float upright in the water. Now I bethought me that if I could get into this barrel I should be safe from the sharks for a while, but how to do it I did not know. While I wondered, chanced to glance behind me, I saw the fin of a shark standing above the water not twenty paces away, and advancing rapidly towards me. Then terror seized me, and gave me the strength and the wit of despair. Pulling down the edge of the barrow till the water began to pour into it, I seized it on either side with my hands, and lifting up my weight upon them, I doubled my knees. To this hour I cannot tell how I accomplished it but the next second I was in the cast, with no other hurt than a scraped shin. But though I had found a boat, the boat itself was like to swim, for what with my weight and with the rotten meal and of the water which had poured over the rim, the edge of the barrel was now an inch above the level of the sea, and I knew that did another bucketful come aboard, it would no longer bear me. At that moment also I saw the fin of the shark within four yards, 
and then felt the barrel shake as the fish struck it with his nose. Now I began to bail furiously with my hands, and as I bailed the edge of the cask lifted itself above the water. When it had risen some two inches, the shark, enraged by my escape, came to the surface, and turning on its side, bit at the tub so that I heard its teeth grate in the wood and iron bands, causing it to heel over and to spin round, shipping more water as it healed. Now I must bail afresh, and had the fish renewed its onset, I should have been lost. But not finding wood and iron to its taste, it went away for a while, although I saw its fin from time to time for the space above an hour. I bailed with my hand, till I could lift the water no longer, then making shift to take off my boot. I bailed with it. Soon the edge of the cask stood twelve inches above the water, and I did not lighten it further, fearing that lest it should overturn. Now I had time to rest and to remember that all this was of no avail, since I must die at last either by the sea or because of thirst, and I lamented that my cowardice had only sufficed to prolong my sufferings. Then I prayed to God to succour me, and never did I pray more heartily in that hour, and when I had finished praying some sort of peace and hope fell upon me. I thought it was marvellous that I should have thus escaped thrice from great perils within the space of a few days, first from the sinking carrack, then from pestilence and starvation in the hold of the slave-ship, and now, if only for a while, from the cruel jaws of the sharks. It seemed to me that I had not been preserved from dangers which proved fatal to so many only that I might perish miserably at least, and even in my despair I began to hope when hope was folly, though whether this relief was sent to me from above, or whether it was simply that being so much alive at the moment I could not believe that I should soon be dead, is not for me to say. At the least my courage rose again, and I could not even find heart to note the beauty of the night. The sea was smooth as a pond, there was no breath of wind, and now that the moon began to sink, thousands of stars of a marvellous brightness such as we do not see in England gemmed the heavens everywhere. At last there grew pale, and dawn began to flush the east, and after it came the first rays of sunlight. But now I could not see fifty yards around me because of the dense mist that had gathered on the face of the quiet water, and hung there for an hour or more. When the sun was well up and the length of the mist cleared away, I perceived that I had drifted far from the ship, of which I could only see the mass that grew ever fainter, till they vanished. Now the surface of the sea was clear of fog except in one direction where it hung in a thick bank of vapour, though why it should rest there and nowhere else I could not understand. Then the hot sun grew, and my sufferings commenced, for except the draught of spirits that had been given me in the hold of the slave-ship, I had touched no drink for a day and a night. I will not tell them all in particular detail, it is enough to say that those can scarcely imagine them who have never stood for an hour after hour in a barrel, bareheaded and parched with thirst, while the fierce heat of the tropical sun beat down on them from above, and was reflected upward from the glassy surface of the water. In time, indeed, I grew faint and dizzy and could hardly save myself from falling into the sea. And at last I sank into a sort of sleep or insensibility, from which I was awakened by the sound of a screaming bird and of falling water. I looked and saw, to my wonder and delight, 
that what I had taken to be a bank of mist was really low-lying land, and that I was drifting rapidly with the tide towards the bar of the large river. The sound of the birds came from the great flocks of seagulls that were preying on the shoals of fish, which fed at the meeting of the fresh and the salt water. Presently, as I watched, a gull seized a fish that could not have weighed less than three pounds, and strove to lift it from the sea. Failing this, it beat the fish on the head with its beak until it died, and had begun to devour it, when I drifted down upon the spot and made haste to seize the fish. In another moment, dreadful as it may seem, I was devouring the raw food, and never never have i eaten with better appetite or found more refreshment in a meal when i had swallowed all that i was able without drinking water i put the rest of the fish into the pocket of my coat and turned my thoughts to the breakers on the bar soon it was evident to me that i could not pass them standing in my barrel so i i hastened to upset myself into the water and to climb astride of it. Presently we were in the surf, and I had much ado to cling on, but the tide bore me forward bravely, and in half an hour more the breakers were past, and I was in the mouth of the great river. Now fortune favoured me still further, for I found a piece of wood floating on the stream which served me as a paddle and by its help I was enabled to steer my craft towards the shore, that as I went I perceived to be clothed with thick reeds, in which tall and lovely trees grew in groups, bearing clusters of large nuts in their crowns. Hither to this shore I came without further accident, having spent some ten hours in my tub, though it was but a chance that I did so because of the horrible reptiles called crocodiles, or by some alligators, with which this river swarmed. But of them I knew nothing as yet. I reached land but just in time, for before I was ashore the tide turned, and tide and current began to carry me out to sea again, whence assuredly I would never come back. Indeed, for the last ten minutes it took all the strength that I had to force the barrel towards the bank. At length, however, I perceived that it floated in not more than four feet of water, and sliding from it I waded to the bank, and cast myself at length there to rest and thank God, who thus far had preserved me miraculously. But my thirst which now returned upon me more fiercely than ever, would not suffer me to lie thus for long. So I staggered to my feet, and walked along the bank of the river, till I came to a pool of rain-water, which on the taste of it proved to be sweet and good. Then I drank, weeping for the joy of the taste of the water, drank till I could drink no more and let those who stood in such plight remember what water was to them, for no words of mine can tell it. After I had drunk, and washed the brine from my face and body, I drew out the remainder of my fish, and ate it thankfully. And thus refreshed, cast myself down to sleep in the shade of a bush, bearing white flowers, for I was utterly outworn. When I opened my eyes again, it was night, and doubtless I should have slept on through many more hours had it not been for the dreadful itch and pain that took on every part of my body, till at length I sprang up and cursed in my agony. At first I was at loss to know what occasioned this torment, till I perceived that the air was alive with gnat-like insects which made a singing noise and settling on my flesh, sucked blood, and spat poison into the wounds at one at the same times. These dreadful insects the Spaniards named mosquitoes. Nor were they the only flies, 
for hundreds of other creatures no bigger than a pin's head had fastened on to me like bulldogs to a baited bear boring their heads into the flesh where in the end they cause festers they are named garapatas by the spanish and i take them be the young of the tick others there were also too numerous to mention and of every shape and size though they had this in common all bit and were very venomous before the morning these plagues had driven me almost to madness for in no way could i obtain relief from them towards dawn i went and lay in the water thinking to lessen my sufferings but before i had been there ten minutes i saw a huge crocodile rise up from the mud beside me i sprang away to the bank horribly afraid for never before had i beheld so monstrous and evil-looking a brute to fall again into the clutches of the creatures winged and crawling that were waiting for me by their myriads but enough of these damnable insects End of chapter 12 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 13 of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 13 The Stone of Sacrifice. At length the morning broke and found me in a sorry plight, for my face was swollen to the size of a pumpkin by the venom of the mosquitoes and the rest of my body was in little better shape. Moreover, I could not keep myself still because of the itching, but must run and jump like a madman. And where was I to run to through the swamp, in which I could see no shelter or sign of man? I could not guess, so since I must keep moving, I followed the bank of the river, as I walked disturbing many crocodiles and loathsome snakes. Now I knew I could not live long in such suffering, and determined to struggle forward till I fell down insensible, and death put an end to my torments. For an hour or more I went on thus, till I came to a place that was clear of bush and reeds. Across this I skipped and danced, striking with my swollen hands at the gnats which buzzed about my head. Now the end was not far off, for I was exhausted and near to falling, when suddenly I came upon a party of men, brown in colour and clothed with white garments, who had been fishing in the river. By them on the water were several canoes in which were loads of merchandise, and they were now engaged in eating. So soon as these men caught sight of me, they uttered exclamations in an unknown tongue, and seizing weapons that lay by them, bows and arrows and wooden clubs set on either side with spikes of flinty glass, they made towards me as though to kill me. Now I lifted up my hands praying for mercy, and seeing that I was unarmed and helpless, the men laid down their arms and addressed me. I shook my head to show that I could not understand and pointed first to the sea, and then to my swollen features. They nodded, and going to one of the canoes, a man brought from it a paste of a brown colour and aromatic smell. Then by signs he directed me to remove such garments as remained on me, the fashion of which seemed to puzzle them greatly. This being done, they proceeded to anoint my body with the paste the touch of which gave me a most blessed relief from my intolerable itching and burning, and moreover rendered my flesh distasteful to the insects, for after that they plagued me little. When I was anointed they offered me food, fried fish and cakes of meal, together with a most delicious hot drink covered with a brown and foaming froth that I learned to know afterwards as chocolate. When I had finished eating, 
having talked a while together in low tones, they motioned me to enter one of the canoes, giving me mats to lie on. I obeyed, and three other men came with me, for the canoe was large. One of these, a very grave man with a gentle face and a manner whom I took to be the chief of the party, sat down opposite to me, and the other two placing themselves in the bow and stern of the boat, which they drove along by means of paddles. Then we started, followed by three other canoes, and before we had gone a mile utter weariness overpowered me, and I fell asleep. Oh, I awoke much refreshed, having slept many hours, for now the sun was setting, and was astonished to find the grave-looking man my companion in the canoe, keeping watch over my sleep, and warding the gnats from me with a leafy branch. His kindness seemed to show that I was in no danger of ill-treatment, and my fears on that point being set at rest, I began to wonder as to what strange land I had come, and who its people might be. Soon, however, I gave over having nothing to build on, and observed the scenery instead. Now we were paddling up a smaller river than the one the banks of which I had been cast away on, and were no longer in the midst of marshes. On either side of us was land, open land, or rather land that would have been open had it not been for the great trees, larger than the largest oak which grew upon it, some of them of surpassing beauty. Up these trees climbed creepers that hung like ropes, even from the topmost boughs, and among them were many strange and gorgeous flowering plants that seemed to cling to the bark, as moss clings to a wall. In their branches also sat harsh-voiced birds of brilliant colours, and apes that barked and chattered as we went by. Just as the sun set over this strange new scene, the canoes came to a landing-place built of timber, and we disembarked. Now it grew dark suddenly, and all I could discover was that I was being led along a good road. Presently we reached a gate, which from the barking of dogs and the number of people who thronged about it I judged to be the entrance of a town, and passing it we advanced down a long street with houses on either side. At the doorway of the last house my companion halted, and taking me by the hand led me into the long low-lit room with lamps of earthenware. Here some women came forward and kissed him, while others, whom I took to be servants, saluted him by touching the floor with one hand. Soon, however, all eyes were turned on me, and many eager questions were asked of the chief, of which I could only guess the purpose. When all had gazed their fill, supper was served, a rich meal of many strange meats, and of this I was invited to partake, which I did, seated on a mat and eating off the dishes that were placed on the ground by the women. Among these I noticed one girl who far surpassed all the others in grace, though none were unpleasing to the eye. She was dark, indeed, but her features were regular and eyes were fine. Her figure was tall and straight, and the sweetness of her face added to the charm of her beauty. I mention this girl for two reasons. First, because she saved me once from sacrifice, and once from torture, and secondly, because she was none other than that woman who afterwards became known as Marina, the mistress of Cortes, without whose aid he had never conquered Mexico. But at this time she did not guess that it was her destiny to bring her country to of Anahuac beneath the cruel yoke of the Spaniard. From the moment of my entry I saw that Marina, as I will still call her, for her Indian name is too long to be written, took pity on my forlorn state, and did what lay in her power to protect me from vulgar curiosity, and to minister to my wants. It was she who brought me water to wash in, 
and a clean robe of linen to replace my foul and tattered garments, and a cloak fashioned of bright feathers for my shoulders. When the supper was done, a mat was given to me to sleep on in a little room apart, and here I lay down, thinking that though I might be lost for ever in my own world, at least I had fallen among people who were gentle and kindly, and moreover, as I saw from many tokens, no savages. One thing, however, disturbed me. I discovered that though I was well treated, also I was a prisoner, for a man armed with a copper spear slept across the doorway of my little room. Before I lay down, I looked through the wooden bars which served as a protection to the window-pane, and saw that the house stood upon the border of a large open space, in the midst of which a great pyramid towered a hundred feet or more in the air. On the top of this pyramid was a building of stone that I took to be a temple, and rightly in front of which a fire burned. Marvelling what the purpose of this great work might be, and in honour of what faith it was erected, I went to sleep. On the morrow I was to learn. Here it may be convenient for me to state what I did not discover till afterwards, that I was in the city of Tabasco, the capital of one of the southern provinces of Anahuac which is situated at a distance of some hundreds of miles from the central city of Tenochtitlan, or Mexico. The river where I had been cast away was the Rio de Tabasco, where Cortes landed in the following year, and my host, or rather my captor, was the cacique of Chief of Tabasco, the same man who subsequently presented Marina to Cortes. Thus it came about that, with the exception of a certain Aguilar, who with some companions was wrecked on the coast of Yucatan six years before, I was the first white man who had ever dwelt among the Indians. This Aguilar was rescued by Cortes, though his companions were all sacrificed to Huitzel, the horrible war-god of the country. But the name of the Spaniards was already known to the Indians who looked on them with superstitious fear, for in the year previous to my being cast away, the Hildago Hernandez de Cordova had visited the coast of Yucatan, and fought several battles with the natives, and earlier in the same year of my arrival, Juan de Grigalva had come to this very river of Tabasco. Thus it came about that I was set down as one of the strange new nation of Tules as the Indians name the Spaniards, and therefore as an enemy of whose blood the gods were thirsting. I awoke at dawn, much refreshed with sleep, and having washed and clothed myself in the linen robes that were provided for me, I came into the large room where food was given me. Scarcely had I finished my meal when my captor, the cacique, entered accompanied by two men whose appearance struck terror in my heart. In countenance they were fierce and horrible, they wore black robes embroidered with mystic characters in red, and their long and tangled hair was matted together with some strange substance. These men, whom all present, including the chief or cacique, seemed to look on with utmost reverence, glared at me with a fierce glee that made my blood run cold. One of them, indeed tore open my white robe and placed his filthy hand upon my heart which beat quickly enough counting its throbs aloud while the others nodded at his words afterwards i learned that he was saying that i was very strong glancing round to find the interpretation of this act upon the faces of those about me my eyes caught those of the girl marina and there was that in them which left me in little doubt Horror and pity were written there, and I knew that some dreadful death overshadowed me. Before I could do anything, before I could even think, I was seized by the priests, or pabas, as the Indians name them, and dragged from the room, all of the household following us except Marina and the cacique. 
now i found myself in a great square or market-place bordered by many fine houses of white stone and lime and some of mud which was filling rapidly with a vast number of people men women and children who all stared at me as i went towards the pyramid on the top of which the fire burned at the foot of this pyramid i was led into a little chamber hollowed in its thickness and here my dress was torn from me by the priests leaving me naked except for a cloth about my loins and a chaplet of bright flowers which was set upon my head in this chamber were three other men indians who from the horror on their faces i judged to be also doomed to death presently a drum began to beat high above us and we were taken to the chamber and placed in a procession of many priests i being the first among the victims then the priests set up a chant and we began to ascend of the pyramid following a road that wound round and round its bulk till it ended in a platform at its summit which may have measured forty paces in the square hence the view of the surrounding country was very fine but in that hour i scarcely noticed it having no care for prospects however pleasing on the further side of the platform were two wooden towers fifty feet or so in height these were the temples of the gods quetzal of war and quetzal god of air whose hideous effigies carved in stone grinned at us through the open doorways in the chambers of these temples stood small altars and on the altars were large dishes of gold containing the hearts of those who had been sacrificed on the yesterday these chambers moreover were encrusted with every sort of filth in front of the temples stood the altar whereupon the fire burned eternally and before it were a hog backed block of black marble of the size of an inn drinking table and a great carven stone shaped like a wheel measuring some ten feet across with a copper ring in its centre all of these things i remembered afterwards though at the time i scarcely seemed to see them for hardly were we arrived on the platform when i was seized and dragged to the wheel-shaped stone here a hide girdle was put round my waist and secured to the ring by a rope long enough to enable me to run to the edge of the stone and no further then a flint pointed spear was given to me and spears were given also to the two captives who accompanied me and it was made clear to me by the signs that i must fight with them it being their part to leap upon the stone and mine to defend it now i thought that if i could kill these two poor creatures perhaps i myself should be allowed to go free and so to save my life i prepared to take theirs if i could presently the head priest gave a signal commanding the two men to attack me but they were so lost in fear that they did not even stir then the priest began to flog them with leather girdles till at length crying out with pain they ran at me one reached the stone and leapt upon it a little before the other and i struck the spear through his arm instantly he dropped his weapon and fled and the other man fled also for there was no fight in them nor would any flogger bring them to face me again seeing that they could not make them brave the priest determined to have done with them amidst a great noise of music and chanting he whom i had smitten was seized and dragged to the hog-backed block of marble which in turn was a stone of sacrifice on this he was cast down breast upwards and held by five priests two gripping his hands two his legs and one his head then having donned a scarlet robe the head priest that same who felt my heart uttered some kind of prayer and raising a curved knife of the flint-like glass or istli struck open the poor wretch's breast in a single blow and made the ancient offering to the sun as he did this all the multitude in the place below in full view of whom this bloody game was played prostrated themselves 
remaining on their knees till the offering had been thrown into the golden censer before the statue of the god Whitzel. Thereupon the horrible priests, casting themselves on the body, carried it with shouts to the edge of the pyramid or Teocalli, and rolled it down the steep sides. At the foot of the slope it was lifted and borne away by certain men who were waiting, for what purpose I did not know at that time. Scarcely was the first victim dead when the second was seized and treated in like fashion, the multitude prostrating themselves as before, and then, last of all, came my turn. I felt myself seized, and my senses swam, for I did not recover them till I found myself lying on their cursed stone, the priests dragging at my limbs and head, and my breast strained upwards till the skin was stretched tight as that of a drum, while over me stood the human devil in his red mantle, the glass knife in his hand. Oh, never shall I forget his wicked face, maddened with the lust of blood, or for the glare in his eyes as he tossed back his matted locks. But he did not strike at once. He gloated over me, pricking me with the point of the knife. It seemed to me that I lay there for years, while the paber aimed and pointed with the knife. But at last, through a mist that gathered before my eyes, I saw it flash upwards. Then, when I thought that my hour had come, a hand caught his arm in mid-air and held it, and I heard a voice whispering. What was said did not please the priest, for suddenly he howled aloud and made a dash towards me to kill me. But once again his arm was caught before the knife fell. Then he withdrew into the temple of the god Quetzal, and for a long while I lay upon the stone, suffering the agonies of a hundred deaths, for I believed that it was determined to torture me before I died, and that my slaughter had been stayed for this purpose. There I lay upon the stone, the fierce sunlight beating on my breast, while from below came the faint murmur of the thousands of the wandering people. All my life seemed to pass before me as I was stretched upon the awful bed. A hundred little things which I had forgotten came back to me, and with them memories of childhood, of my oath to my father, of Lily's farewell kiss and words, of de Garcia's face as I was hurled into the sea, of the death of Isabella Siguenza, and lastly a vague wonder as to why all priests were so cruel. At length I heard footsteps and shut my eyes, for I could not bear the sight of that dreadful knife no longer. But behold, no knife fell. Suddenly my hands were loosed, and I was lifted to my feet, on which I had never hoped to stand again. Then I was borne to the edge of the Teocalli, for I could not walk and here my would-be murderer, the priest, having first shouted some words to the spectators below, that caused them to murmur like a forest when the wind stirs it, clasped me in his blood-stained arms, and kissed me on the forehead. Now it was for the first time that I noticed my captor, the cacique, standing at my side, grave, courteous, and smiling as he had smiled when he handed me to the papas, so he smiled when he took me back from them. Then having been cleansed and clothed, I was led into the sanctuary of the god Quetzal, and stood face to face with the hideous image there, staring at the golden censer that was to have received my heart while the priest uttered prayers. Thence I was supported down the winding road of the pyramid till I came to its foot, where my captor, the cacique, took me by the hand and led me through the people who, it seemed now, regarded me with some sort of strange veneration. The first person that I saw when we reached the house was Marina, who looked at me and murmured soft words that I could not understand. 
then I was suffered to go to my chamber, and there I passed the rest of the day, prostrated by all that I had undergone. Truly I had come to the land of devils. And now I will tell you how it was that I came to be saved from the knife. Marina, having taken some liking to me, pitied my sad fate, and being very quick-witted, she found a way to rescue me. For when I had been led off to sacrifice, she spoke to the cacique, her lord, bringing it to his mind that, by common report, Montezuma, the emperor of Anahuac, was disturbed as to the Tules or Spaniards, and desired much to see one. Now, she said, I was evidently a Tule, and Montezuma would be angered, indeed, if I were sacrificed in a far-off town, instead of being sent to him to sacrifice if he saw fit. To this the cacique answered that the words were wise, but that she should have spoken them before, for now the priest had got hold of me, and it was hopeless to save me from their grip. Nay, answered Marina, there is this to be said. Quetzal, the god of whom this tule is to be offered, was a white man, and it may well happen that this man is one of his children. Will it please a god that his child should be offered to him? At the least, if the god is not angered, Montezuma will certainly be wroth, and wreak his vengeance on you and all the priests. Now when the cacique heard of this, he saw that Marina spoke truth, and hurrying up the teocalli, he caught the knife as it was in the act of falling upon me. At first the head-priest was angered, and called out that this was sacrilege, but when the cacique told him his mind, he understood that he would do wisely not to run a risk of the wrath of Montezuma. So I was loosed and led into the sanctuary, and when I came out, the paber announced to the people that the god had declared me to be one of his children, and it was for this reason that then and thereafter they treated me with reverence. End of chapter 13 Recording by Patrick 79